I'm Liz McDade, a huge Columbo fan and a small business owner living in Santa Cruz, California, and this is my brother. I'm Paul McDade, an assistant editor and sometimes editor and occasional actor working in the TV and film industry here in Los Angeles. And this is Trenchcoat Cigar Peugeot Wandering with Columbo. And in each episode, we'll bring you a little Hollywood history, glamour, and behind the scenes as we walk you through Columbo, one of America's greatest TV detective series. That is right. And today, or tonight, or this morning, whenever you're listening, we are talking about season four, episode four, Troubled Waters, which aired on February 9th, 1975. And for every episode, we have a drink and a snack that's inspired by the show. And tonight's snack is peanuts, or any nuts, or popcorn. And tonight's drink is margaritas, although you could also have a scotch and water for this episode. So, Paul, tell me what you what you're nibbling on over there. Uh, well, I didn't get any popcorn, um, although I love popcorn. I I just I got um, some summer coleslaw from Vaughn's. The, what the guy the guy the guy <laughs> I was I was trying to find like an orange liqueur for the to make the mar- margarita. Paul, oh. uh, this guy came up and he worked at Vaughn's and he's really nice and he started suggesting things. So, oh my gosh. That, 21 Seeds tequila. Well, he 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 suggests a couple of things, but 21 Seeds had um had some orange, what do you call it, infusion in it. So instead of getting liqueur, because the liqueur was kind of pricey, um, I got that. I got some stirring simple syrup. Mm-hmm. And then we already had some Espada Pequeña Mezcal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and then I got some lime, squeeze, squeeze some lime juice. Um, oh, and I got artichokes too. <laughs> he he recommended that. He recommended he recommended pita chips first. With uh, what do you recommend? Oh, um, I don't know about this pita- guy at Bonds, yeah. Paul. Oh no, he's good. <laughs> All right, so Paul's popcorn is actually coleslaw. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm having a really simple margarita that's made with um, the tequila. It's Tequila Blanco by Espalone, and it, it also has some orange liqueur. I think the brand, I got a really a very low price liqueur because I didn't want to spend a ton of money on something I'm never going to consume, but it is, um, it might be like De Keppers or something. And then I added um, some fresh squeezed lime juice, and it's quite delicious. I also put some salt on the rim, but I realized I probably should have put a mixture of salt and sugar on the rim. And then I'm just having some very simple popcorn with salt. So that's where we're at. Cheers, Paul. Cheers. And we're recording this on a on a Saturday night, so this is very appropriate. Mm-hmm. Troubled waters. Troubled waters. And next up, we're going to get into Smoke Signals. This is where we read lesson, letters from listeners. Oh, man, that tequila is already affecting my oh, tongue, I think. It is. I better watch out. Um, we had two lovely letters that we wanted to share in this episode. And the first one is from Brian. Thanks for emailing us, Brian. Brian writes, thanks for the podcast you do on Columbo. It brings me back to when I watch them. And Brian has a couple of requests for us to review Ashes to Ashes and Strange Bedfellows. Ashes to Ashes has Patrick McGuhan and Rue McLanahan. And I think Patrick's daughter may have a role too. I really Mm. like that one, he says. Strange Bedfellows has a lot of drama because of the mafia angle. And I like how Columbo is sick due to eating bad clams. (laughs) And I do not, I think I have seen these episodes. I don't remember them, Paul, but I am looking forward to that. Um, Brian has only one critique for us, Paul. It seems like in every episode, Paul mentions his wife and her name. We get it. You're married. What? What? (laughs) And we hear her name every time. What? (laughs) Uh, Thank you for the feedback, Brian. Yes. Thanks, Brian. We appreciate it. And thanks for writing us. We love hearing from you all. Yeah. Uh, Paul's got a letter too. 
Yeah, the other letter is from Rick. Rick uh, says, I get to L.A. area every few years, but this particular trip, my wife and another couple were along, and we were hobnobbing around L.A., Hollywood for a long weekend, going to great restaurants, staying at a super cool hotel, walking around and hanging poolside, amongst other things. <clears throat> and Rick says, we were having drinks at the Beverly Hills Hotel one of the nights when my friend notices... Peter Falk what? milling around across the lobby and and in his trench coat. Oh my Too gosh! Funny, amazing. Rick said, "Yeah." Then Rick says, "My wife gets right up, goes over and approaches him. She says hello and asks him if he knew where the pool was. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to me the pool was obvious and right there, but nonetheless, he played along, smiled at her, and said hello and pointed to the pool. That was pretty much it. It was cute." That's awesome. Very awesome. And then he says, yeah, he also says, uh, I would say my top three episodes are Murder by the Book, Love Jack Cassidy, Any Old Port in the Storm, Love Donald Pleasance, Negative Reaction, Love Dick Van Dyke. So thank you, Rick. That was a great, great uh, letter, uh, great story. Yeah, those are great episodes too. Yeah, and thank you, Brian. And thank you to everyone yeah. who writes to us. We always thank love you, hearing man. from you. If you want to share your favorite Columbos or a memory, you can email us at trenchcoatcigar at gmail.com. All right. So now we're going to get into troubled waters here, Paul. And we're going to start off with a summary. Columbo is on a cruise with his wife when the singer, Rosanna Wells, is murdered by her ex-lover, Hayden Danziger after Rosanna tries to blackmail him. Instead of living it up with his wife, Columbo is pulled into the crime and is hot on the trail after finding an out of place feather. Although he does live it up, or at least she lived it up one night. <laughs> yeah. They did get at least one night of whooping it up before the murder. And then once, you know, they get to. Well, we'll get to it, but they do get to enjoy the cruise after the murder is solved as well. The boat, you mean? The cruise. I know, but they're on a boat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a ship. I know, I know. Um, well, let's start. I always like to start with the title, and um, the title is very apt in this case. So Troubled Waters, as you know, Paul, it's an expression for a difficult situation. And in this episode, the difficulty is the murder, and it's also literally on the water. So it's a wonderful title. And um, it opens, we are actually um, at a dock. There's a large cruise ship pulled up to a dock. And I just want to say that David Koenig's book, which we talk about almost every episode, um, called Shooting Columbo has some really great details about this episode. So if you don't have the book, dear listener, you might want to get it. So the entire episode was inspired by a recent episode, you know, recently back in 75 of Hawaii Five-0 that included a cruise ship. So Universal Studios wanted to do a cruise ship episode with Columbo. And um, according to uh, Koenig's research, the studio reached out to the same cruise line that hosted Hawaii Five O, but that cruise line turned them down. I think the the line was something like they didn't feel like a pretend murder was on brand for the cruise experience that they wanted to promote. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, they found another cruise line that was willing to host them that was heading out to sea at the same time that the studio wanted to film. So this was filmed on an actual 12 day cruise from San Francisco to Mexico. And this was the maiden voyage of the sun princess, a newly remodeled cruise ship. And I was just poking around a tiny bit to find out where cruise ships take off from in San Francisco. And I'm pretty sure this opening scene was filmed at Pier 35 in San Francisco. The interior of the pier looks really similar to what we see in this opening shot of Colombo running through 
trying to get onto the ship. There's really similar windows and ceiling beams. And I don't think I've ever actually been to this pier before, but next time I'm in the city, I am going to have to go take some photos. Maybe I'll try to recreate this scene and like run through the pier towards a cruise ship. See what happens. Major, how many piers do they have? Like major piers like that in San Francisco? Because that's a major one. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's at least one other one for cruise ships, Mm -hmm. but it looked a bit different when I saw photos. And then there's a lot of other piers. I mean, I don't know. Like commercial, where they have like restaurants, and then you know, isn't it seems like they would have a because they have all kinds of shipping, you know, stuff going on there, obviously. Yeah, a lot of the big ships that come across the Pacific Ocean actually go right across the bay to Oakland. Oh, it's Oakland. Okay, and yeah, yeah. Oakland handles the major, um, oh, I'm blanking on the word, the big, you know, the big, long, rectangular shipping boxes. Yeah, from when I, I stayed in Oakland one night and went into San Francisco the next day with the family. And yeah, it was amazing to see those. So those are in Oakland. San Francisco's more like, I guess, occasional cruise ships and... I don't know, fishing boats and maybe whale watching boats, stuff like that. So the opening scene, Columbo's running through the building and there's a lot of a lot of bystanders in this scene. It kind of looks like a lot of them are watching Columbo run and it's hard to tell which ones were um like it's hard to tell if they were told, "Hey, watch this guy because he's running and he looks funny," or if they were just random people also on the pier who saw Peter Falk and they saw a big movie crew. Like, it's hard to tell if these are (laughs) extras or I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, Paul. Yeah, no, definitely. I think there's a mix. And in Canning's book, he does say, you know, that people were, it was like called the Columbo cruise and you, you could get a scene possibly. Um, But supposedly they typically shot when no one was there. So then they would have to bring in extras, but does look like they grabbed a few shots, like when he's walking up, maybe. But the, I, I noticed that too. Even in um, at the end of the end, well, the end of uh, uh, the the what's his name, the guy who was in the the bad guy you just mentioned that the Brian wanted us to watch, Patrick McGuhan. Patrick McGuhan on one of his shows, and one of the end of one of his episodes it looked like it was a far away. It was a, it was extreme long shot and he was in London and people were turning. And I was like, Oh, this looks like they didn't tell them, you know, and people just like, and it's like, like at uh, the British one, when Columbo goes to see the Royal Mm -hmm. family or whatever the parade he's watching and he's trying to get pictures. You see people turning around and there's that look of recognition, but that's, it's quite, it's quite, quite common i think uh for people to utilize that because if they don't notice you it's a great shot and you have all these people although although you have to get clearance and stuff like that sometimes you have to put up a post somewhere yeah um but in earlier films they didn't care you know because you see everything in the shot i'm trying to think of a a movie but i always notice that i always look for that i always look for the reactions like oh (laughs) Mm -hmm. they they, they see peter fox (laughs) right now Genuine reactions. These are not, you know, pre-planned reactions. So he he runs through, he climbs over some barriers, makes it onto the gangway, and gets into the lobby of the cruise ship. And I'm not going to go on and on about all of the amazing costumes in this episode, Paul, but there are some really great looks starting right here in the lobby of the cruise ship. Just going to highlight one. There's a woman wearing a hot pink floral jumpsuit. Very cool. And then throughout the whole ship, there's a lovely rust orange carpeting. Um, Or so some levels it's rust orange, some levels it's pea green and a light wood paneling all around. It's just a really cool, very 70s interior. It takes you back to that time. Um, very, very great. I I just loved all the visuals in this episode. Yeah. Columbo file in his book, the Columbo, the Columbo companion. That's one of the, um, 
things he mentions is the costumes mm-hmm. in this episode of what they're the in this in this particular episode yeah um he talks about you know of course uh peter fox shirt at the end or towards oh, yeah. the, you know the, the, the last quarter or whatever um so yeah no i i there, yeah for sure i yeah, love that shirt it's, yeah it's a great that, shirt. that shirt holds up i'm like i want that shirt oh yeah we got to get you one paul so good It's a really good shirt. All right. So Columbo's in the lobby. He's kind of scrambling around. He finds the purser. I guess this is like the right hand man to the captain. Tells the purser he can't find his wife. The captain walks up because it's clear there's something going on. And captain says he knows Columbo's wife is on board. Everything is okay. And I got curious. I don't know why, but I was wondering, is this the first and only time that a Columbo begins with Columbo because normally Columbo begins with uh, mm-hmm. some other people. And then we see him mm-hmm. enter a bit later. And we see the murder first as well. Exactly. Um, I found a lovely blog and <laughs> it's called, um, maybe I'll include it in the show notes, but it's by someone named Mark. And the blog is at a website. It's longair.net. That's not the full web address. So that's all I wrote down. But I will get the full web address for our show notes. But Mark made a really cool graph of how many minutes into a Columbo episode, Columbo shows up. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah. And so I found his blog. I found this graph. There's one other episode. Oh, no, sorry. Two other episodes where it actually starts with Columbo. And I know you won't know one of them, Paul, but you might know the second. Wait, wait, have... Say that again. There's one that, another one that he starts in the beginning? Yeah, there's two other episodes of Columbo where he is the first. He's in the first scene. Um, Don, no. I, uh, now go and tell me. Okay, so one of them you might have seen. It's called Make Me a Perfect Murder. It's coming up in a later season. And one of them you probably haven't seen. It's called Rest in Peace, Mrs. Columbo. And it's part of the reboot series. Oh, yeah. I, I, maybe the second one, you the first one you said, I've seen it. Who's in that? Who's the bad guy in that? The bad guy in that one, I can't remember the actress's name, but she is a TV executive. Um. And she murders another TV executive who's also her lover because he gets promoted and is going to be going off to New York. And she, and he does not want her to come with him. So he basically breaks up with her and gives her a car as a parting gift. What season was that? Do you remember? It's like five or six. I Someone listening is probably yelling yeah. at me it, right it now. <laughs> I can't remember. But in the start of that one, Columbo is driving down the road, not paying attention to his surroundings, and he gets rear-ended. Mm. Oh, that's season seven, episode three. Oh, there we go. Thank you. And and so Columbo ends up wearing a um, soft neck brace for the rest of that oh. um, episode. Yeah, that one. I'm. Sh- I think I. I want to say went through all of them when they were on Netflix or something or s- something. I remember like a few years ago or probably like 10 years ago now with my brain that I want, I feel like I went through all of the, you know, the first run, but, um, but maybe not, maybe there's some I haven't seen from this. I, I really this, like that. looks that familiar. One. Yeah. Trish yeah. Van Dever. That looks familiar. Mm-hmm. She looks, I recognize her, but the episode looks familiar. Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry. My little bit of trivia got us derailed, but I was, <laughs> I was very That's curious. So I had to, figure that out all right it's time to meet mr danziger paul yeah baby he 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 walks up to the purser and the captain looking very dapper in an all-white suit with a lovely dark red shirt with a really wide collar and a little neckerchief around his neck i think this is either called a cravat or an ascot I don't know. I I don't know. And Mrs. Danziger is by his side wearing a really nice silky turban um, on the back of her head and a matching wool plaid suit silk scarf. So they both give off really fancy vibes. 
Danziger chats with the captain. Captain clearly knows him and says, we've got a really lovely room or suite lined up for you. So let's go see this suite, Paul. Okay. It looks wonderful. It's got a ton of windows. Um, It's quite large. And you probably saw this, Paul, in Koenig's book, but a lot of the interiors, uh, sorry, a lot of the room scenes were filmed um, on a universal soundstage because the actual cabins on the cruise ship were just too small for all the cast and the crew. So the room here is probably not an actual cruise room, but it looks very nice. And Danziger is looking around for his golf gloves, and apparently his butler forgot might have forgotten to pack them. And he gets a little bit rude with his wife, but then he apologizes. So we're learning a little bit about this relationship here in this opening scene. So now we're going to go back to Columbo, who is looking for his wife. He's calling her from a cruise phone somehow. He can't find her, but he can (laughs) call her. (laughs) It's like a white courtesy, a a green courtesy telephone. Yeah. And in the background is a really cute group of seniors, Paul. I don't know if you noticed them. Um, They look like grandparents in their Sunday bests on a big friend's cruise. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's really sweet. (laughs) And, and now we, we get, we kind of get started. We sort of take off on the cruise and we get a really cool shot of the boat in the ocean. That's one thing that I like about this episode is that there's a, there's a, a good number of these shots of the cruise ship actually in the water, actually moving. So it kind of feels, I started to feel relaxed watching it. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm on a cruise too. I'm out there. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I do. I did like all the new footage, you know, so that they had to shoot those shots for the for the ship that they use. That was part of the deal to have those wide shots, you know, to advertise it. Oh, OK. Is that in Koenig's book, too? Yeah. Yeah. But but just the realism of being there, you know, um, like the opening shot when he's walking down the where the port is and then all these shots where you see the them steering the boat, you know, the boat. Um, and then all the shots of all the people everywhere inside. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reminds yeah. me of just yeah stuff from the seventies. You get a little clearer view of like what people wore. It's it's not a set. You know, you know the rooms are like you said, but the other places are not set. So you see, or like the color of the of the lights, like when he goes to to the gift shop, which you're going to mention here. Like mm-hmm. you can see the coloring is a little different with the lights. Um, mm-hmm. but it reminds me of, um, uh, just a lot of those films when they used real locations, uh, the, the Robert McGoohan, Robert McGoohan, that's his name, right? Patrick. Or Pat, Patrick McGoohan. I'm thinking of. Well, how many margaritas did you have before we <laughs> you know, started? Only, this, this is the only one, but, um, uh, I think of scanners, that movie scanners I was talking about. There are these shots that they use of a mall in the seventies and they use like these other locations that don't look like sets at all. Mm-hmm. I don't think they were cause it was, that was a pretty low budget thing. So it's, yeah, I just love that. Cause it's like, yeah, this is pretty real. It's probably spruced up by the, the set prop people, but um, you know, there's a certain reality to it that works well. Yeah. Oh no, I totally agree. I, I love, I love that. I love, seeing that and i don't think i have my note here but um when we when we get a little further into the episode i found some interior photos online of the sun princess because you know it was like a big deal when it got remodeled and rebranded and whatever so i think i might even have a link um to more photos of the original cruise ship that we should include in our instagram photos paul i'm going to make a note more sun princess photos. Um, okay, yeah. All right. So, so let's go back to our villain, Hayden Danziger. He goes to the purser who is somewhere near the, you know, the control room or the flight deck, whatever they call it on a cruise ship. He goes to the purser and says they only got one key to their suite, but they need a second one. 
and the purser is happy to give Danzinger another copy of the key. And we hear the test alarm system go off, which is going to be a recurring, you know, moment throughout this episode. So Danziger's leaving the the purser and bumps into Columbo, who walks up to him in the gift shop area and tells Danzinger a long winded way of saying, like, how do we get more food on this boat? He's Columbo's kind of going on and on, but Danzinger has cuts him off and and walks away. He says, push the red button. Yeah, and he keeps looking at his watch and looking to his left. I gotta go. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. Really good scene, really good acting. And you can see the the paperback books behind Columbo and to the ah. left of Columbo. Oh, and if you look if you look, I just noticed one of the one of the pe- people who are walking walks by Columbo. You can tell that's one of the passengers because the act is <laughs> she's just supposed to walk past him. And she almost like she's like silently walking by him, looking down, holding her lip <laughs> as if she's gotten very close to stardom. There. Oh, I love it. I love all those moments. It's just it's excellent. Yeah, this is one that I, I definitely want to watch again. You, she She actually looks towards the camera. That lady I just mentioned. <laughs> I watched it again. It's great. That's the best when they do that. Yeah. So Danziger uh, makes his way back to his room and he's got a code book of some sort in his room. He's going to fiddle with this extra key he got from the purser whose name is Watkins. So he's, this guy's clearly up to no good. Yeah. This is great. I love this thing he has. (laughs) Yeah. As a, as a used car salesman, that's what, he has to make those kinds of things, right? Mm-hmm. Or create good, that stuff, I guess. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. It's a good detail. Paul, we're going to go meet the band. I'm there. Lloyd, Artie, and Melissa are sitting around a small table. And this is where our snack comes from. I can't exactly tell what Melissa is eating, but it looks like maybe they're eating peanuts, something small and crunchy, and finger foods. They're in some kind of a lounge or a bar. Lloyd is clearly looking around for someone. And Melissa and Artie tell him to relax. Artie also tells Lloyd, you really should stay away from Rosanna. Mm -hmm. It's a great scene. Yeah. I love this little trio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're the three of them are. I haven't seen much of Susan's stuff. But I've seen so much of Peter Maloney, who plays Artie, and Dean Stockwell, who plays Lloyd. What else was um, Artie in, Paul? I haven't seen, I don't think I've seen him. Uh, he was, what, what the first thing that I remembered was um, The Thing. Oh, okay. With uh, John Carpenter made it with Kurt Russell. The cast of The Thing is superb cast. It's like uh, Keith David... Who else is in that? It's just like uh, one of the, one of my favorite casts of a film. Like I love that oh, film. Cool. Yeah. Um, the music, the 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 script. It's just a very. Um, it, 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 I think it holds up. I've seen it probably like three times or four times over my fifty three years. It's like mm-hmm. you know, once every ten years, I'll watch it maybe. Okay. Um. But. Uh, T.K. Carter is in it. Uh, but yeah, Peter Malone, Richard Mauser. It's just a really interesting... Uh, I, oh, I wrote down the casting director of that film. And I, I noticed she, she hadn't done a ton of casting, but she and John Carpenter and who have the producers, they they hit a... It was Anita Dan. Anita D-A-N-N. She did Nightmares, uh, Milu Estevez movie that was pretty good. Heartbeeps, Zoot Suit, which was really big. Um, Bustin' Loose, The Incredible Shrinking Woman. Um, she, you know, she had a good run there, but that that's probably one of the best cast films with a small, you know, group of mm-hmm. male actors. Um, mm-hmm. That just uh, was pretty phenomenal. Uh, but let's see, he, uh, Peter Maloney. Um, he was in Requiem for a Dream. Oh, he's, really? He still does stuff. I mean, he's oh, as long he's as still... he dispatches from elsewhere. Um, he was in in that. 
a couple episodes of that. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know he was still an actor. Yeah. Um, still JFK. Us. Tune in tomorrow with Peter Falk, which is an interesting kind of quirky film. Uh, Manhunter. That's a great film. The Michael Mann film. Uh, what I remember, you know, as a, as a kid, um, hide in plain sight, James Caan breaking away. But uh, yes, he's so good in this uh, Columbo. Like you, you actually get to see him shine and he's not the main character. Yeah. yeah. I, I was Dean really Stock's impressed. Hair. I want to get my hair like that. You're, you were really impressed. You should do it, Paul. Get get that Dean Stockwell hairdo. So cool. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was really impressed by all the supporting cast in this. And and um, Robert Vaughn. I mean, he's mm-hmm. so good in this, I I thought. But, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. All right, so back to the cruise. Lloyd spots someone, Rosanna, the singer. She's dressed in an amazing, like, loungy, vacation-y singer outfit. Something that's going to turn heads, right? Like, she's clearly a performer. Um, And Lloyd sits down next to her. He's trying to reconnect with her. And she basically blows him off. And he loses his cool. And he raises his voice. And then he storms off. And, oh, and here's where I have the, the link so the lounge here was, I believe this was the Union Jack bar of the Sun Princess. And you hmm. can see these photos in an article from USA Today that's online. So I'll make sure to include that link in our show notes too. And we'll try to get some of these photos on our Instagram as well. But it's a really cool lounge with lots of red vinyl seating and shiny metal tables. And it's just a, it just has a lot of personality for a space. Um, Yeah, you see real water moving behind them. mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love that you, that you can tell you're actually on a ship for so much of this episode. Okay, we're going to go back to Danziger, Paul. Again, he's clearly up to no good. He's wandering the halls or the corridors of the ship, and he lets himself into a cabin that's clearly not his, starts searching around for something, and he plants a receipt in a metal box of receipts. I don't know if we know. I can't remember if we can actually tell that it's a receipt in this scene, but that's what he's doing. He's planting a receipt. I think so. I think we can. And he throws away that stuff, too, and overboard. The, the little stuff? key, oh, the key right. thing, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then uh, something else. Didn't Elliot do that one time when you guys were on a cruise? <laughs> Didn't he? Paul, we have never been on a cruise. No? This, Would you do we that? Are, we are not cruise kind of people. I do like sailing. I like going out on a sailboat. Um, and I like sitting on a pontoon as well and cruising down or cruising around a lake. But I have not been on a cruise. Yeah, it seems like it it could be fun. They they you know, they have like those cruises with for dating and then they have ah. cruises what, for Why is that the first cruise you bring up, Paul? Cuz I've been <laughs> because my wife and I've been talking about doing that. Like a swap. We all know you're married thing. because you mention it every single episode. Yeah, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but um no, no, I know that um, the the psychic Sylvia Brown. I don't know if she's still around. I remember her saying that she did that. Like she would, you go on the cruise and then you get to hear her talk and maybe get a reading or something like that. But I think I think I heard that right. But um, okay. I, I don't. They, yeah, it seems like it'd be like this. Looked like the the mega cruise at the time, right? Like all kinds of stuff to do. But now they have the Disney cruises, right? Like where there's pools and. So much to do. You know, different pools and movies and dancing and massages and you know mm-hmm. all all this all these activities that you can plan out. Yeah, yeah, a lot of options that, that, out there. That'd be interesting as a career. Don't they have they have that show that reality show where they're like upstairs down? No, it's like cruise. You follow the crew. You're like the there's there's like you follow the people who work on the cruise ship. There, well, I, there's probably that one. I definitely probably, know. There's of, like three or four of those. Yeah, I know of the one where they're on a um, smaller boat. It's it's they call it below deck, 
Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. It's not a big cruise ship. Okay. It's not a big cruise ship. It's a really oh, okay. fancy yacht for like oh. eight eight guests. It's like eight guests and like ten crew members. Um I actually really like that show, Paul. <laughs> oh, it's been going for I I worked at the one of the companies that did one of those shows. I didn't work on the show, but I remember that was one of their big hits. And it's still going. So, I mean, because that was, I was there a long time. I think it was before Vesta was born. Yeah. I, I don't like all of the seasons. I just want to clarify who I am as a person. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, so the season, some seasons you like more than others? Why is some, that? Well, some seasons, there's a lot of this f- silly drama where they're like, oh my gosh, you said that about me. No, I didn't. You know, there's that. And then some seasons, it's, somebody who's really trying to learn how to be a good manager and how to get his crew or her crew to do the work. And I find that really interesting. And then of course I love the scenery and I love, you know, snippets of the debauchery of these ridiculous guests. Um, <laughs> well, because some of them are, some of the guests are like, who are these horrible people? But I, I do really enjoy that, 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 deep look at what it how do you get these like young inexperienced you know fun loving people motivated and on task and how do you build your team I don't know and then there's like I said there's the snippets of the drama but they're very it's not the whole Mm -hmm. story it's the drama well that's cool I don't know I'm I'm totally overselling it right now following the things that you like seeing and and... (laughs) there's a lot of trash on there too so I'm not (laughs) I'm not saying it's you should watch that show at all, but like, well, it's like the um, I, I used to love the Project Greenlight, where the they pick a filmmaker who would never made a you know feature film. Mm-hmm. They had just done like short films, and then they pick their favorite short film, and then they give them access to make their to make a feature film. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like I loved seeing this sort of different people who have their own qualities. Some of our commercial director, some are like, like me, kind of a hermit didn't, you know, just doing their mm-hmm. own little thing along the way. And then they get this, you know, here, we want, we want to give you a film. Cause yeah. you, you know, I imagine myself in that situation, you know, like, wouldn't that be great if, mm-hmm. you know, Matt Damon gave me <laughs> you know, yeah. like money to make yeah. a film. Come on, let's make this happen. But <laughs> he's a, he's so, a listener. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that's, I could see how you would see yourself, right? You see yourself a little bit like that, right? In the entrepreneurial, you know, because that's what you do in a way. Yeah. Uh huh. So, or maybe you, what? So the debauched uh, uh, customers, <laughs> what were you saying? Like the, the, yeah. the people? The people who read, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up because I know our listeners want more Columbo and less yeah. below deck. <laughs> but I will say that a lot of, a lot of the, the, but the individuals who rent the boat um, have w- more money than cents and they come on and they blow off way too much steam and just make bad decisions and they're rude and they drink way too much. And yeah, there was, this is, this is going off again. Sorry, everybody, but uh you know that show cheaters <laughs> show called cheaters. Yes, I never watched it, <laughs> but yes, I know the show. <laughs> It was awful. They had the the host of the show, a guy tried to kill him. Oh wow! Yeah, because he was so upset that you you turned me into you know I was cheating right. and you of course for for the world to see. Yeah, and they were on a boat when yeah. it happened. They were on a boat. What? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that just popped in my head. So just okay. tying in with the yeah the Columbo thing. It's so. a, that's like a mashup, blow deck and troubled waters mashup right there. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Back to Columbo. There's some really good stuff happening. Um, in this moment, Danziger, after he plants a receipt, he goes into another cabin and he hides a gun underneath some life vests. And right after he finishes hiding the gun, Rosanna walks in. So this is her cabin. And she catches him there. And she here's where we learn the plot. Here's where we learn what's coming, right? We learn mm-hmm. that Hayden Danzinger and Rosanna Wells had an affair. Now she's blackmailing him so that 
she's blackmailing him from telling his wife. He's very unhappy. He puts his arms, his hands around her neck in a mm-hmm. really like scary way. And, but he says, I'm, he, he says he's going to pay her when they mm-hmm. reach the dock. So he's trying to appease her. But but now we see we know what's happening here, and now it's time for a dip in a pool, Paul. Well, he hits her too. Oh, right. he physically punches her. Yeah, so you're I like, think maybe yeah, I've, this I've blocked is that out. <laughs> yeah, <that. laughs> yeah, no, it's different. You know, you usually don't see that kind of thing in Columbo. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, you don't usually see very much violence, and definitely not that kind of violence. At the same time, I mean, obviously he's in the wrong. He's a horrible person, but at the same time, she's not a really great person either. You know, she's clearly used him and uh, broken Lloyd's heart. And, you know, she's got her own agenda. Yeah, she's it's a it's a nice thing for her because she's an amazing singer, too. Mm-hmm. You know, so she does this gig, you know, but she yeah, I love when she this, you know, when she sings that song. It's yeah, the famous she's so Italian good. song. Yeah, I think this is one of her like very few movie credits or, or any kind of TV or movie credit. Yeah. Yeah. I think she was, she was quite popular. Uh, well-known. I watched a documentary about a movie she was in. If you look at her credits, just a handful of things, but she was in a movie. Dennis Hopper. After he did easy rider, that movie made millions of dollars for Columbia and so they were like, we we need more filmmakers like this. Universal gave like a million dollars or something to a handful of these independent filmmakers like Dennis Hopper, the guy who did Tulane Blacktop, Monty Hellman. That's a really good film. He was one guy. Um, Dennis Hopper was also another person and they gave him money for this. He He wrote a script with the guy who wrote Rebel Without a Cause, the last, it was called The Last Movie. Dennis Hopper only gave himself credit for the screenwriting in the end because they went off book and stuff. But but uh, Pupe uh, Bacar is in that film as a singer. She sings a song oh. in Spanish. Um, but in the documentary, they're looking at the list of all the actors. Dean Stockwell was in it too, actually, playing Billy oh, the cool. Kid. Wait, um, which one is this? Tulane Blacktop? No, that's the film by Monty Hellman that Universal gave money to a few up and coming directors because Easy Rider had done so well. Okay. Um, you know, like a low budget film. So they're like, we want artists like that now instead of yeah. doing the same old. They're like, know, how do we make a lot of money from a <laughs> little money? <laughs> but also like from, from n- none of those movies actually made money. Maybe Tulane Blacktop. Uh, in the end, had such silver lining. It's it, that's I think it's such an amazing film. I think that film had silver lining where it probably, in the end, maybe made all that money back. I don't. I, you'd have to look at the figures. But the last movie won at the Venice Film Festival, but Universal wouldn't release it, and it lost money um, or didn't make any money. Mm-hmm. But she's in there, and yeah, and it, it's a very disturbing scene that she's in. Actually, uh, they list her as nightclub singer. But it's a it's a pretty uh, big little part, um, if that makes sense. There's not a lot of. Wait, what's the name of this film that was never released? Uh, the last movie. Oh, okay. I mean, it's it, you know, it's eventually released on DVD. Oh, okay. um, and, and VHS. Um, but I don't think it went. Maybe it went to film. You know, went, it obviously went to the Venice Film Festival. But but he uh, a lot of people like the the sound mixer or editor. He said that they should have kept the story chronological and followed the script. So did the script writer. Mm-hmm. And they were like, you could have had a, he could have had a more return with Lou Wasserman and everybody at universal and having them release it. If it was more, co- more coherent, uh, you know, obviously, oh, okay. or if you had trusted your artists and like tried to promote them, maybe, maybe it would have, maybe would have made its money back, but they, I don't think they released it, but uh, he kept changing it because he had a big entourage, Dennis Hopper. Anyway, back to the actress. She's in it, and it's a, it's a. She speaks Spanish. She sings in Spanish, mm-hmm. and the role that she does is very um, hefty. The, the whole scene, the two scenes that she's in, one of them she's just singing, the other one is a little. So it's it's a it's a kind of a disturbing got disturbing moments in it in the film. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't watch the whole thing because um, I just got it. I, I had heard about it in college, and I think I watched like a scene or two with friends, and I think I went up, went and did something else. But too much. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of interesting things with it, and I, it does, definitely has a following, I believe. So, okay. and she was in Get Smart. She was in a couple of Get Smart. So I watched yeah. one of them. Okay. Yeah. And she played uh, like a, uh, I think she's a, it's funny because Robert Culp is in this, is in the same scene she's in. Yeah. But she, yeah, I like her. She's, she's, I, I wonder why she didn't do more. Yeah, me too. Um, because I thought she's real talent. Too. She's clearly very talented. My point in the documentary thing was. Yeah. What is your point, Paul? They were looking at all the actors who were originally slated. So some people didn't show up because they shot it in Peru. But when they were, when the act, some people were looking at the list, they mentioned her. They're like, oh, look, they had all these huge stars uh, Dean Stockwell, ah. Pupe Bacar. So, like, so she was obviously quite popular in the, in the 70s, you know? Yeah. At least in the, the film, you know, TV world. I I thought she did great. All right. Well, let's let's dig in here. It's time for a dip in the pool. And the next scene, Danzinger is poolside. He's wearing a swim shirt, which is a button-down shirt that's lined with terry cloth fabric on the inside. <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. Pretty 70s. Wide collar, of course. Wide bright stripes and primary colors. He takes off his shirt to get in the pool, but first he sniffs the capsule that he had in his pocket. And after he sniffs it, he yells out, he grabs his arm, and he falls into the pool. Real quick, who's the lady yeah. that suggests getting a margarita? They're fantastic. Oh, she's so good. That's right. I totally skipped over our drink inspiration. But they don't list her. That's too bad. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I bet um, I bet watch it for days. I bet Shauna oh, knows yeah, who that is. Shauna will. I bet she does. I'm not, yeah. I need to check out her channel because I'm not sure which episode she's up to. But you know, we we had an interview with her. If you haven't listened to that, it's she's great. She does such awesome work. She yes, very deep detailed. dives on all these extras. But yeah, this is the moment that inspires our margarita. Someone, a uh, um, work colleague of Hayden asks if he wants a margarita because they're muy buena. He says, it's a little too early for me. <laughs> Who knows what time it is? I wonder if she was like a real extra and just like, hey. <laughs> and they had a boom. They had a boom over there. So they just got there it. There is and it no works. way she, she, oh, wait. A real extra versus you mean like a, a passerby, like a real passenger. Yeah, like not scripted. Like what if it wasn't scripted? No, this is absolutely scripted. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll go to the WGA and find out. <laughs> Please do and report back immediately. Because she's she's owed a little uh, re, re, revenue. Yeah, some every royalties. Time she says that, every, yeah, that money. Every time she says that, someone takes a sip on a margarita. Like right now, <laughs> like Danziger. So, so he falls into the pool and now we're in the hospital and the ship's doctor is examining Danziger says that his blood pressure is high. His heartbeat is a little bit choppy. And he says that you quote, suffered a slight heart attack, whatever that means. I don't know what that means. But the doctor wants Danzinger to stay overnight in the hotel. And so Danzinger gets cozy in a hotel bed. He learns he's the only person there for the night. Thank goodness. I mean, none of his plan would have worked if there was already another passenger in the hospital. Right? So he learns he's the only one there for the night. And then he looks around the hotel, the hotel, hospital room with this really sl like very subtle, sly gaze. I don't know if you noticed this, Paul. Oh, I think he, he does kinda, that a couple times. He's so good. This is one of those moments where he's he's so subtle. It's it's not like overacted, but it's just there enough where you're like, 
you notice it, but not too much. It's very, I don't know. I was impressed. I'm going to practice that look in the mirror, like try to master the sly, sly gaze. Yeah, no, he has, uh, he was nominated for an Oscar for the young Philadelphians, but he had a, such a long, wonderful career. I got from the library, the towering Inferno with Paul Newman and Steve McQueen. He's in it, but I I didn't get a chance to watch it. Yeah, he's clearly so talented. He's, I mean, we'll, we'll, we get to talk about him in more scenes, but just in this moment, you can see. And in the moment, like when he's talking to Columbo in front of the gift shop, you can tell like, oh, this mm-hmm. guy's got really, he's really skilled. He's, he's good. Okay. Time for a show. Time for a performance, Paul. The boat at night, I, I wrote this down. The boat at night is a sight. They have lights on. It looks really beautiful, cutting through the water in the darkness. And Rosanna is singing Volare, which I will not sing. <laughs> I still feel a little bit bad about singing part of the national anthem in our last mm-hmm. episode. I really hope mm-hmm. people were able to push Forget through that it. and move into <laughs> move into the rest of the episode um but the way she sings this it's such an earworm it's so good she's so skilled and while she's entertaining this crowd and getting them to sing along dan Zinger from the hospital room is up to no good he steals some surgical gloves then he jumps back into bed and melissa comes around with his medicine and to take his pulse And then after she does that, he knows that he has 30 minutes between all of Melissa's visits to do his bad things. And so once she's done, he slips out of the hospital. He puts on some waiter clothes as a disguise. He runs down the staircase. And this is one of those moments we've, you know, they do this in other Columbo's as well. But so they're sort of filming two things happening at the same time, right? So Dan Singer's doing his thing while Rosanna is singing, getting the crowd excited. She finishes her song and she gets off the stage, heads towards the elevators. Uh, Again, there's really amazing costumes in this scene. I just want to point out one someone is wearing a floor length, bright red gown that has this huge white lace collar amazing where is that person this is in the moment when rosanna is finished her set Mm -hmm. uh her first set and she's headed towards her room towards the elevators okay yeah so i i just wonder like how many of these people brought their costumes or quote-unquote costumes it was someone's actual dress um, Paul, I need you to get a screenshot of that for me. Okay, that's Grady Hunt was the costumes. So good. Yeah. So there's also um, a man wearing some white vinyl dress shoes or shiny leather, pleather, patent. That's the word, patent leather, white patent leather shoes. And um, Rosanna gets on the elevator and Lloyd is right behind her. He tries to get on too. He doesn't make it on her elevator with her, so he goes down the stairs to her room, and he's he catches up with her outside her room, says he just wants to apologize, but she blows him off and goes into her cabin to change. And then she sits down in front of her dressing table, and then Danzinger, in his waiter costume, slinks out of his hiding place. So we didn't see him actually get into this hiding place, but he has been in her cabin for a couple of minutes, slinks out. He's got a gun and a pillow, and he shoots her in the back while she's seated. And then he goes to her dressing table, and he takes a lipstick, and he, he sort of scratches an L on her mirror. And then he sneaks back out, relocks the door. I have to say that the... <coughs> The relocking, Paul, with the key is pretty mm-hmm. fishy. <laughs> I think there were a lot of sound effects here. Mm-hmm. It kind of looks like he just pushes his hand against the door and just kind of wiggles it. Probably. Yeah, I mean, the, okay. the sound mixer and, they, they, you know, they, it's a whole layer that they add, you know. Absolutely. 
So he leaves her room, but he locks it. Then he goes just a little ways up and unlocks another room, which is actually the ship's laundry room. He hides the gun in the laundry room and he relocks that door again with sort of his hand just kind of rubbing around on the door, not actually a key locking. No, that's okay. I need to, to just let that go. I do want to point out that the editors reused some of the exact same footage in the stairwell scene. I don't know if you noticed that, Paul. Mm-mm. No. Good catch. Yeah. So I don't know if they didn't just didn't catch enough or they just thought nobody will notice. Liz, will, they, they were like, Liz will never notice. They were Robert wrong. Vaughn walking is different. Yeah. Yeah. Him yeah, going maybe up the stairwell. Take. Maybe it's a different take. Uh, there, there's at least one repeat, like 100% absolute repeat of footage in the stairwell. Okay, this is Robert Kimball, the guy who cut seven Columbos, eight black sheep squadrons, the Manchu Eagle murder caper mystery. Remember that one? Hey, I am not saying anything bad about the editor. I'm just saying. Ten that, a fly. That- <laughs> right. They might have run out of footage or needed to fill like a two seconds. Yeah, I don't know. No, it, yeah, it happens. Yeah, but but they repeat the footage here. Um, so Danzinger is making his way back to the hospital. Lloyd, who went down just after Rosanna, is changed for the second set, and um, kind of glances towards Rosanna's room, but Rosanna's not coming out, obviously, because you know she's been shot, and. Now we're back on stage. The band is the band is back together, but Rosanna's missing. And Artie, I think Artie maybe looks to Lloyd like, you know, mm-hmm. non-verbally where's Rosanna and Lloyd kind of shrugs. So they just do an instrumental set for a bit and then Lloyd goes downstairs to try to figure out, "Hey, where's our singer? We need our singer." And now it's time to wake some people up, Paul. Um, first off, Danzinger gets woken up by Melissa, the nurse, for another check-in. At the same time, Columbo gets woken up by the purser and the captain. He is on the case. He comes to his door in a fuzzy baby blue bathrobe. <laughs> Too bad there's no, like, puffy, frilly, you know, white... I know. What, where are the embellishments? Well, you know, he's a humble, modest person. So mm-hmm. he just has a fuzzy bathrobe, white tank top. And he sees the captain, the purser at his door. And he's like, oh, is it this about my wife? You know, she- <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny. It's such a great scene because I love him being surprised. And I love that they're that they have to reach out to him. You know, he's a, mm-hmm. he's a detective. Can you help us? Mm-hmm. it's great it's just like this oh yeah of course uh yeah so yeah. cool i love this moment i love it so he changes into his suit he's in his work togs and he follows them to, into rosanna's room and he gets briefly startled by the body because they don't say right away what's happening he just is like okay i will follow mm-hmm. you maybe he mm-hmm. maybe he knew you know, we, we will never know what he, what he was, what was happening in his mind, but he follows them. He gets slightly startled by the body. And then I love this scene because it show he gets to show all of his expertise mm-hmm. in this. Oh moment. yeah. He didn't know. I don't think he knew. I mean, I guess he had a, you're right. He probably had an inkling of like, okay, this is probably serious. He must have had an inkling that this is serious and how Definitely, many serious yeah. crimes could happen on a cruise ship that would wake you up in the middle of the night. Like not very many, but um, he was still surprised. And, and so now he's, he's trying to figure out how he can help preserve this crime scene. And he starts asking for some different chemicals from the ship's doctor. Who's there. He asks for a photographer and they say Forbes. He's a very discreet chap. (laughs) It's like, what does that mean? I love it. Well, you know, Forbes isn't going to talk a, a lot of smack. He's going to keep it to himself. Yeah. He says, Forbes says, that'd you know, be me. Bad. 
That'd be me. That would be you, Paul. Absolutely. Until You're a discreet a chap. <laughs> 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 and then all the secrets were revealed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Dr. Frank Pierce, Robert Douglas. That guy was a it was a very interesting actor. M- huge career and he goes on to direct one of the Columbos. Oh, cool. Which one? Um, let's see. I'm not sure. But he he actually was in a, a Jane Greer movie I watched. They were in a movie together called The Prisoner of Zenda, which was like the second adaptation. I think Peter Sellers did the third one. They're probably going to do many more. Um, he usually plays like kind of a stern, tough guy, bad, mean guy, mean, like the, the, like he was in the Fountainhead. He was in the Fountainhead with Gary Cooper. Oh, okay. He was great in that one. I I really liked him in that. I thought he stood stood out in that one. Wait, what's the Um, actor's name again, Paul? uh, Robert Douglas. That's the doctor. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very unassuming. Like I, I, when I started watching this, I had already watched, he, he's directed like 41 different things, but I. Wow. I didn't recognize him, right? Because he's just older. But yeah, he ended up edit, uh, directing Beretta, like nine episodes of that. Uh, the episode he directed for this one is Old Fashioned Murder. Oh, I love that one. Uh, that's season six, episode two. It's a little bit slow, but I, I like that okay, one. Okay, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. But yeah, no, he had oh, a, just so. an amazing career. But anyway, I just had to mention that because I, I didn't realize until... Later in the film, I was like, wait, that's Robert Douglas. That's awesome. No, I'm so glad you noticed that because I don't, yeah, I, I kind of count on you to, you know, poke around about some of these actors and I didn't look at him at all. But we're still in Rosanna's cabin here. Columbo goes to the toilet, <laughs> but it's a false alarm. <laughs> but he's clearly feeling some seasickness. And, um, and then he's he's still in the cabin. He's talking with the captain and the doctor. He says, the murderer must have known when the band takes their break. This was not burglary because he notices a, a, um, a, a pearl necklace of Rosanna's that was not stolen. And then he's like, I need to go to the hospital. He He's just too much mm-hmm. seasickness. So he makes his way to the hospital, bangs on the door, and Melissa lets him in. And we get more of, is it Susan or Susanna? Susan is her name. Susan, yeah. Susan. I her mom called her, her. Suze. <laughs> Suze. I thought she was so good. She was just like, I don't know. I loved her presence in this in this episode. Mm-hmm. So she lets him in. She's super kind. Um, and in this scene where he's in the hospital, he finds a feather on the ground. He puts it mm-hmm. in his pocket. He takes his medicine. He he starts to feel a bit better. And Melissa, the nurse, explains that, yeah, we have one patient here only, the person who had the heart attack by the pool. And then they bring Rosanna's body into the hospital while he's still in there. Melissa is very calm during during all of this. Mm-hmm. Very, very, un- I got to say, very unemotional considering that she knew this woman, at least on some level. You know, there's no tears. So I don't know if oh, that that's a good is, point. I don't know if that's just an oversight in the script or if that speaks to the kind of vibes that Rosanna gave off because, you know, we know she's. She wasn't the warmest person. Um, That's a little oversight, yeah, in the writing, and then then Gazara and them re- recognizing that it obviously I don't think it was in the script, or we'd see it, you know, because that's a good, that's a great point. I feel like you know, I'd be like, what shot? What are you talking about? I mean, it seems like even if you didn't like somebody, if you saw that they had just wait, does she know then? Does she know then? She doesn't know yet. Well, they when bring Columbo in the body. In there. Oh, Not right, until they yes. bring in the body. So she didn't know at that point. Well, we don't exactly know what the doctor said before the doctor went down. Like, probably Melissa didn't know because probably the doctor was asleep and they woke him up and he went to the room. So she probably had no idea what was going on. But maybe she, maybe he was in the hospital and 
he got the call in the hospital and he told her. But most likely this is her first that maybe they're I don't know. Yeah, I think it's between when Columbo's there and then they bring the body in. So that gap between that probably, you know, is when they someone must have given her a heads up like, hey, we're bringing a dead body in. (laughs) Yeah, kind of a big deal. Someone must have told her, but she doesn't seem emotionally upset at all. She, She does seem a little more stark when the body is in there and she's working with her boss, the doctor, right? Yeah, or her 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 partner, you know, and in, and in, in working, so it's so it's like it's down to business, you know. Like the doctor is very, let's get this done. Yeah, that's true. It is down to business, but she shows like no emotion at all. Um, yeah, that would have been extra writing, but that's good. That's good thinking because you you that's real writing and real dramatic. You know, like what's happening and how she's quiet and somber, but as an actress, maybe uh, she she. She was uh, with a lot of different teachers, um, Susan. So she's super skilled. I mean, she's still doing stuff. She still she has a play about her life that she's a musical that she's created. Yeah, that's awesome. She has a podcast too. Oh, really? We got a yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, it in the, our show notes. The musical play is called Life, Death, and Entertainment, and uh, it starts off talking about her dad, Vince. Um, it's funny. It's very, it's also has, you know, some serious elements to it, but yeah, I think, yeah, I think that that would go with um, William Driscoll and Jackson Gillis, you know, two really good writers, but there's only so much time you have and you never, you never know, but, but that opening scene with them together, that's a good thing right there. You just pointed out. It's like, why, why wasn't that connected? You know, there's a couple things in here, like the wife too, we'll get to, you know, Jane, why isn't Jane visiting, you know, her husband? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. What is she doing while he's in the hospital? That is an excellent question too. She disappears, and I think uh, the Columbo file mentions uh, maybe she was ill or or Koenig. One of them, I think, is the. You know, it was a uh, Columbo file. He mentions in his book uh, maybe Jane was was ill, but I thought that too that she was underused. Sylvia Danziger, Jane Greer. Yeah, she was great. She was really great. Um, okay, where are we? We are in the hospital, and they um, have brought Rosanna's body in to the hospital. Columbo accidentally walks in. Well, you know, quote unquote, accidentally walks into Danziger's oh, that's directive. Yeah, he does. Yeah, that yeah. <laughs> he he looks to see them turn around, and then he turns to the left and he pushes. It's a great. It's very funny. Um, and then the doctor says, you, you need to leave. This is a very sick patient. Um, but Columbo oh, gets yeah, an yeah. eye on who's in there. He's like, who is the person who might've brought this feather into this mm-hmm. space? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Columbo leaves Danziger's room and the doctor has gotten the bullet out of Rosanna's body. You know, this is also one of those moments that we don't really see very often. We, there's never an autopsy. I, I mean, I don't want to say never, but very rarely is there an autopsy, you know, in this way in a Columbo. It's more like the doctor is offset, you know, out of the script and Columbo just gets the evidence. But in, in this one, you know, the doctor's there and the doctor gives Columbo the bullet directly and tells him it was a whatever it was, I think he said 38 caliber bullet. And Columbo asks the doctor about the letter that was on drawn on the mirror with the lipstick. Mm -hmm. And um, the doctor's like, well, I guess if she had the lipstick in her hand, right when she was shot, she might've been able to do it, but that's kind of, you know, that would have been hard because the death was pretty instantaneous. And then, Columbo learns about Lloyd. Columbo is like, whose name starts with an L? And he learns about someone named Lloyd. And then we cut to Artie. I like this moment. I like this editing moment where Columbo learns about Lloyd. And then we instantly are looking at Artie. And Artie's saying, Lloyd? <laughs> He's totally surprised and, you know, does couldn't imagine Lloyd hurting anyone. And... Artie says, it couldn't be Lloyd. Lloyd's last name is Harrington, by the way. So sometimes they say Lloyd, sometimes they say Harrington. It's like, he's a nice guy. 
Yeah, he's a nice guy. It couldn't be Lloyd. <laughs> so then they they go to Lloyd and question him. And Lloyd says, uh, what, you know, he, he's just has no idea what's happening. He's just answering their questions. And then they tell him, um, he says, yeah, she never came back for the second set. And then they tell him, you know, she was murdered. And I wanted to ask you, Paul, if you had thoughts about his sur surprised face. Like, what did you... Of Artie's? No, Dean Stockwell. When Dean Stockwell learns... I, that's that what I meant. I meant Lloyd Harrington, yeah. Um, Lloyd Harrington. Yeah, I, I thought he did... I thought he did a decent job. Like, I was thinking about it when I saw it, like, in terms of reality. Yeah. I think I think because he's young and, 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 like, probably was slightly fearful... Um, and he did, he did kind of, kind of nods like, huh? Like questioning, like, what, you know, um, he's a, he's such a interesting actor. You know, we've talked about him before. Mm -hmm. He didn't yeah. want to be an actor. You know, he was an actor when he was a kid. Um, and he tried to get out of it, but he just couldn't do anything else. So he went back to it, but he, he's so good. He's so natural. And, um, yeah, I guess he had the innate ability or the, the, the ability to naturally be quizzical in his behavior, you know, like he's in the original, he's, he was in the David Lynch version of Dune mm -hmm. and he was in blue velvet with David Lynch. But in that one, he plays kind of a, kind of an odd, I forget his character, but he was, you wouldn't, I wasn't sure if I trusted him in that mm -hmm. role, you know, like, he, and yeah. I think it was meant to be that way somewhat. Um, Cause I think um, Paul Atreides, the Dune, character the main character in the book is timothy the chalamet yeah he's the prince <laughs> uh and the other one it was kyle mclaughlin the one that dean stockwell's in and um i think his dad is you know says don't trust anybody you know and so but dean was able to fit in that thing really well i think he won an oscar was nominated for uh married to the mob jonathan demi oh, film i love that Michelle movie Pfeiffer. yeah he's so funny like that was like dynamite. Like he was so, yeah. he's so different in that one. I never saw the quantum leap. Did you ever watch that TV show? The TV you show? Did? I did. I wasn't like a regular watcher, but um, mm -hmm. if it was on the TV I and I was, I had time, I would probably watch it. Dennis Quaid. Yeah. Dennis Quaid. Uh, no, it was another guy. So he was nominated for uh, Married to the Mob, best actor in his supporting role, but he didn't win. Moving on. Um, so Lloyd is, you know, doesn't know what's going on, but they take him to his cabin anyways, and they examine his hands. He doesn't have any kind of powder marks, so it doesn't look like he's the murderer, but he could have worn gloves, and he's the only person they can think of whose name starts with L, and he has any sort of motive towards Rosanna. So Dean Stockwell slash Lloyd Harrington realizes that he's the prime suspect at this time. So the band has finished and now there's a magician doing a magic show with a gun where he has his assistant fire a gun at him and it goes through only one of the cards because he's holding like a, you know, like a deck of, he's holding like a hand of cards in his hand and the bullet goes through one card. Anyhow, it's a very cool trick. I have no idea how he does it. Do you know, Paul, how one does this magic trick? I don't. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's very cool. And Columbo is testing out the timing to get to the staff cabins. And it takes him a bit of time to get down there with all of the other guests moving around. About, I think he says, eight minutes. 
And in this time, the purser finds a receipt for a 38 caliber gun in Lloyd's belongings, hands it to Columbo. But Columbo is confused. So the investigation has started and Columbo doesn't quite know it's what's happening just yet. We're going to go back to Danziger in the hospital. He's packing up, getting ready to leave the hospital. He shoves some latex gloves into his pants very quickly. And Columbo comes in and chats with him about the case. Danzinger says he knows there was a murder. Uh, it was, you know, pretty hard to hide that they were bringing a body into the hospital. And this is one of the, fr- this, well, this isn't the first back and forth between Columbo and Danziger because they chatted earlier by the gift shop. But I love this back and forth. This is the first time that Danziger is a murder suspect <laughs> and talking to Columbo. He's so calm and smooth, like remarkably calm and smooth. But Columbo gets him to agree to help him out with this investigation because he, Columbo convinces him that if he helps out his guests, Danzinger's guests won't be as bothered by the investigation. <laughs> yeah, all, all of his, his uh, car friends. Yeah. Right? His car friends. You make that sound like a, a dirty word, Paul. Or what does Danzinger dirty say? Word? You make it sound like some kind of disease. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then Danzinger goes off to some deck on the cruise ship that's pretty much empty. There's no one around. He throws the latex gloves overboard. Then we're going to go to the laundry room because the ship staff have discovered the gun in a bin of laundry. And I have to wonder why is the ceiling so low in this laundry room? Paul, did you notice that the captain and the purser barely fit in this room? Um, no, I didn't (laughs) notice that. Yeah. I could tell by your, um, that you did not notice. Yeah. I'm like, I was searching for it and like, I don't remember it, but yeah, (laughs) but I believe you. (laughs) They're basically crouching into the laundry room. And that's Columbo and Danziger. No, the, the captain and the purser. Oh, Oh, duh. Sorry. Columbo does not have to crouch at all. (laughs) I just had to wonder. I I don't know, but I just had to wonder, like, was this filmed in the actual laundry room of the cruise ship? If so, do you have to be under a certain height to work in the laundry room? Because if you're too tall, you, you won't be able to work in there. You'll be crouching the whole time. He's five, six. He's an inch shorter than me. So. Okay. Nice. He's an inch and a, no, two inches and a quarter taller than me. All right, let's move on. Columbo's in the flight deck. I had to look that word up because I know there's a special word for that room on a ship where all the controls are. It's where the captain and the crew steer the deck. It's called the flight deck, which seems Go ahead, Liz, I'm sorry. No, no, you go. I think that's the angle of the room. Like the angle of the camera is really low and they're sort of leaning down towards the camera. Ah, okay. So I, th- I see what you're, I, th- I think what you're seeing is sort of a slightly optical illusion. Okay. All right. So maybe it it's just an be. illusion. I mean, it, it's okay. not, it's not that tall, but, but they are, you know, like, oh, I see when they do walk in, you're right. You are so right. <laughs> But they, yeah, you were so right. I'm so wrong. Because I, I just noticed them walking in and it was more pronounced. Was that your one of your pups out there barking? Yeah, it's Chico. Okay, he's six foot Patrick McNee. But yeah, anyway, so you're right. Yeah, they got to lean forward. I told you. I'm always right, Paul. Yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm not always right. I'm often wrong. <laughs> I always joke with Hazel and Beatrice. I'm like, you know, I'm always right. But there was this one time when I was 15. <laughs> you said that You say that to them? And I was wrong. <laughs> I, I just joke with them about that. I can definitely be wrong, but it felt like they were too tall for this space. 
Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I might be right because sometimes I'm right. All right, so back to the flight deck. Um, Columbo's in the flight deck with the captain and the purser, and he again is sharing all of his knowledge. I kind of, I, I kind of love this aspect of this episode. We know that he has really good intuition and is super observant. We know all of that about him. But in this episode, we also learn that he knows a little bit of the technical stuff too. He knows a little bit of the chemistry and the fingerprinting and the, um, the, the gun firing, the, what do you call that? Ballistics. Um, so in this moment, he has the gun he wants to check the gun for fingerprints. So he does, he starts, he gets a pencil. He starts carving the pencil. He's trying to get to the pencil lead. He also asks for a piece of paper. He asks for a mattress. And there's a nice little like couplet or quadruplet or whatever of lines here uh, where, where, Columbo says, yes, sir, any kind of mattress will do. And so then the captain asks the purser for a mattress. And the ma- and the purser asks some kind of flight crew member for a mattress. And the f- other crew guy says, a mattress, sir. And the purser says, yes, any mattress will do. Anyhow, I'm totally killing the humor. <laughs> <laughs> I it's destroyed funny. I thought it. it was funny. <laughs> I like crushed it. But it's a funny little moment. Columbo's got a knife. He's carving this pencil. He gets to the lead of the pencil. And Danzinger shows up. Columbo admits that his technique with the pencil isn't very popular anymore. But it still works. And he uses it to try to test for prints on the gun. And then Columbo doesn't see prints. So he says, oh, the killer must have used gloves. And in this moment, he says, I don't think that Lloyd Harrington, the band member, is the murderer. And a couple other things happen. So they get this mattress. They put it out on the deck of the cruise ship. And Columbo asks Danzinger to fire the gun into the mattress. And then Columbo tears into the mattress, pulls the bullet out to do a side-by-side comparison with the murder bullet. And it's a match. I did a tiny bit of Googling, Paul, on whether or not you can really fire a gun into a mattress the way they did here. But then there, it was it was like a whole bunch of like, you know, gun enthusiast <laughs> YouTube channels. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't really want to watch a bunch of guys with their guns um, testing out different things. So I couldn't really determine if this would be a legitimate way of getting a bullet and then, you know, pulling it out and testing it. It it might, it might be, I'm just going to say it it might work. If you had the perfect angle, if you fired into the mattress at a, at the perfect, correct angle, you might be able to actually stop the bullet within the mattress, pull it out and test it. But that's as far as I got, because I was like, I don't want to watch a bunch of these. There's all these YouTube channels where People are like firing guns and doing stuff. I'm just, I'm not interested in it. <laughs> so, yeah, no, there's a lot. I've gone on there to get sound effects before, you know, like real sounds to like try and match with the gun they're using. Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of, you get, you know, I have some generic libraries that everybody has. Yeah. Hollywood sounds and stuff like that. And you want to, you want to, you know, real sound people will go to the, get the actual gun and they'll record that firing gun wherever you're at, wherever the scene is supposed to take place. And they'll record that particular gun. Um, But yeah, I did work on a gun show for channel and we had to get a, yeah, it was, there there was some, some hunting stuff in it and, or kind of like that. But yeah, one of the editors was so upset (laughs) by what we were cutting that, that they had to quit. (laughs) Oh, Wow. Yeah, they're like, I can't, I can't do this. This is, yeah. this is too upsetting. But um, yeah, I feel like there's just there's a divide in this country where you know, and, and we're not going to get super political, but like yeah. some people are comfortable with guns and they know how to use guns and they 
use guns. And then a lot of people don't. <laughs> and I'm on the people who don't side. So, <laughs> so yeah. Um, I didn't want to like get pulled into that world. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So where was I? They were, they were using the mattress to get the bullet. Um, and then the two of them have another chat. Danziger and Columbo have another, another chat together. And Danziger is saying, it seems really clear that this Lloyd Harrington character is going to be the murderer. And Columbus, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Don't say obvious. it. Do I not know. say it, my friend. He says just, way too much. Yeah, this is like. Solidify Columbo's <laughs> gut reaction. This is suspect advice rule number one just don't <laughs> <laughs> but he can't help himself he can't resist he's like lloyd harrington must be the one colombo says he just wants to check on the other passengers who've done the cruise before and in this scene colombo also learns i think that the captain and the purser are standing by and he also learns that there's a special staircase just for crew so now he's kind of piecing things together, like how would Danziger have gotten from the hospital to Rosanna's room in that tight window? And, oh, there's a special staircase, so that's good to know. And um, and now we're going to play some ring toss. Are you ready for this, Paul? Mm-hmm. There's a guy hey, filming hey, this... it, Super 8. I wonder if they have oh, that that's someone, right. Someone oh, my gosh. Footage. I love, oh, Paul, we should put out a Craigslist ad. Maybe they'll have it. Someone will have it. <laughs> there is an amazing extra or a background actor in this scene. Did you notice him, Paul? Please tell me. <laughs> Please tell me you see this amazing extra during the ring toss game on the deck of the cruise ship. Oh, with the hat sitting on the side? The tank top? And? Hat, tank top, and? And short shorts, boots, black okay. socks. No. All right. Maybe this is who you're seeing. Does the man's shirt say anything? Oh, no, I don't think so. Okay. So in this scene, there is an, an elderly gentleman as an extra or background actor wearing a tank top that says beach bum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now I see him. Okay, it's a closer shot. Okay. He's wearing a navy blue speedo, like a little like little bitty swim shorts, baseball cap, sunglasses, and he has glasses in his hands, and he has a newspaper <laughs> in his other hand. One hand has reading glasses and one hand has a newspaper. Well, he didn't want to leave his things on the set on I, somewhere else, so he had to bring everything with him to get dude, in the shot. I get it. I get it. He's amazing. He needs his own poster. I'm just yeah, going to say, beach bum. like, Beach Bum, we love you. You did great, whoever you are. Maybe Shauna yeah. from Watch It From Days. <laughs> yeah, Watch she'll it know. From Days. She'll yeah, know man. who he is. <laughs> she'll know he, his descendants, so we can write them a thank you note yeah. for their grandfather's performance. It was... He looks. He looks like a little bit like Arliss <laughs> Howard. Do you know that actor? No, I, I don't know the reference. I'm sorry, Paul. He was in Full Metal Jacket. Okay. Um, Arliss he used Howard. Used to be married to Deborah Winger, I think, or was involved okay. with her. Okay. Wonderful her. actor. He's. I believe he's from Texas. I know Texas. Yeah, he was recently in uh, that came out last year, The Killer. Based on the graphic novel, David Fincher directed it's a Netflix show. Um, I heard it was a lot like. Wait, what is this? Uh, it's called the Killer. What is his tie to Beach Bum? He looks like the Beach Bum. <laughs> if he was, if he was like re much older, I mean, he is older now, but it, it he it looks like an older, ver even older version mm -hmm. of him that that's mm -hmm. currently there. Okay. Um, well. Paul, if we ever do That's a Columbo recreation, <laughs> if we do a Columbo recreation um, photo shoot, <laughs> yeah, we can get we, we can need, get some really cool. Uh, what's the lady? Bump. 
Yeah, the lady does the Cindy Sherman, like uh, someone like Cindy Sherman or um, one of these amazing artists who does photographs of other things and recreate, you know, like there's all, there's so many great artists that get these really big budgets and they're able to like recreate something really weird. That would be a good one. Yeah. Beach bum. I'm I'm writing they, can it have, down. they can have you be the beach bum. Okay. Do I have to shave my head though? <laughs> If you're going to do it right, yeah. You got to go all in. I have to talk to my family about that. I mean, I'm open, but it feels big. It feels big. All the girls are fine with that. Paul, you have to grab me a screenshot of Beach Bum. Okay. Okay? Second shot. He's amazing. He's amazing. Danziger. Okay. (laughs) Back to the plot. Okay. Beach Bum, we loved you. You just sucked us in for a minute but let's go back to the plot danzinger is playing ring toss on the deck with a colleague i don't even know if ring toss is the word but he's tossing rings towards like scoring zones on um on the deck colombo walks up he tries to play but he actually tosses the ring overboard and and um the two of them go for a walk together Columbo says, you look like you belong on a boat, but he wants, the two of them want to talk together privately. I can't remember if it was, I think it might've been actually Danzinger who wanted to talk privately. It's a cool area so they, they go to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like an empty lounge. There's, and, and this is in Koenig's book, right? They had to schedule their filming around the boat schedule so that, mm-hmm. you know, well, they could have yeah. some space. That's the concert area. Is that where they are? Because mm-hmm. you can see that. Well, it's one of them. You can see the pianists yeah. up there. And the, there's a few people in there. But it's a quick turn. They turn back to the window to sit by the window. It's very brief. Yeah, that's it's a cool, cool place. It's beautiful. Yeah, so like I said earlier, we're going to link to the USA Today article that has some really cool photos of the original Sun Princess 1975 um renovations all right so they're in this lounge and Columbo says to Danziger that the reason he's interested in Danziger's colleagues is that um, someone must have had a key to the laundry room so that means that makes him think that this was someone who might have had a master key and that makes him think that this was someone who could make a master key. And that makes him think it was, you know, these used car salespeople because they have to constantly be, be making keys for cars. And then Columbo shares he also thinks that the receipt was planted in Harrington's room because Harrington only saved receipts that were tax deductions. And a gun is not a tax deduction. It's not work-related at all. So there's no reason to say that. Columbo is also bothered by the fact that Harrington didn't just throw the gun overboard rather than hide it. And then Danzinger says that Harrington probably did not have time to get to a space because the entire ship doesn't have windows everywhere, which makes sense. There's only certain areas like when you're on the deck where you can actually throw something into the ocean. Columbo thought all the little windows, all the decorative portholes actually opened, but they don't. And so, and then Columbo mentions that, um, Harrington or the murderer must have used gloves because there were no prints. And Danzinger says that maybe he used a towel and it was tossed with the um, gun in a laundry room. Anyhow, so this is just the back and forth. Columbo's just getting more time with Danzinger and sort of seeing, whoops, seeing how he reacts to these new pieces of information. It's a fun little moment. It's not their best scene together, but it's, you know, we get the plot moves along and we learn a lot in this moment. And now it's time to get our heart rate up, Paul. It's time for some stairs. Do you ever run the stairs, Paul? Um, No, I had a one of the production post production places I worked at. 
there was several floors and one of my bosses, he would run up the stairs in between like for exercise. Nice. Like he, he, I, and I knew it was him. I was like, Oh, there he, he goes running. And he would like, I was like, great. It was one of my favorite bosses. Yeah. He, he, he was really cool. Yeah. But he would do that. Like blew me away. I was like, man, that's so awesome. We have a really excellent, um, outdoor staircase in Capitola. It's good for exercise. I do not run up it. I will walk up it for exercise. Mm -hmm. But in this scene, Columbo is running up the stairs, not for exercise. He's trying to get more information, collect more data, collect more evidence for his case. So Columbo runs up the crew stairs towards the hospital. Actually, he starts at the hospital. He runs down the crew stairs to the floor that Rosanna's room is on. He runs back up to the hospital and then he starts banging on the door and he asks the doctor to take his pulse. And the doctor says, oh, your heart rate's really high. And then he asks the doctor about their latex glove collection and he learns that some latex gloves are missing. He also learns that Harrington has diabetes and he has to go to the hospital every day for his insulin. So Harrington would have had moments or opportunities to steal latex gloves. Mm -hmm. This is another moment when he is doing this running um, where William Kroniger, the, the director of photography, working with Ben Gazzara, they don't use lighting. They use, I mean, they use natural lighting. Um, in the Friend Indeed, when he goes to the closet, Mm -hmm. And he's looking in the guy's house the, for the in the first murder. Mm -hmm. There's these dark shots of Columbo. There's these beautiful shots. And here it's the same thing when he's going through the hallway, going through the doors. It's these really beautiful shots that are sort of like, they're not evenly lit, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's because they're, I don't think there's much lighting there. You know, maybe, maybe there was something, but it's, you could tell the difference. It really stands out. Um, because I noticed that in a friend indeed, like it really stands out. I like natural lighting. I mean, at the, at Steven Soderbergh, I believe he, you know, he filmed a lot of his movies himself he uses a different name, but I think he's very, he was, or is uh, very uh, keen on natural lighting, you know, n n use the lighting that's available, you know, instead of setting up big lights to, to have the three point, like a light above you, light to the side, light to, to show your face and focus, you know, mm -hmm. giving it more mm -hmm. dimension anyway. But I just, I oh, just cool. noticed that. I didn't notice that the first time I watched it. That's very cool. I'm going to have to, um, I don't have the episode in front of me. I'm gonna have to go back and look at that. That sounds awesome. It just makes it more natural. You know, you yeah. sort of like makes it more believable in some ways. Maybe at the time, some people thought it was, not as good looking, you know, like, Oh, that doesn't look very good. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's this, this whole episode has, uh, has so much of, I think that's what the appeal is. Part of the appeal is this episode is, is that it feels more realistic and natural, you know? Um, well, it's funny. Cause in the, I was just thinking of, I watched what well, there, there was a documentary called, um, Something about Barney Frank, the senator. Is he a senator? Um, Barney Frank? I don't know who that is. Yeah, you do. Barney Frank. <laughs> I have no idea yeah, he, what you're talking about. He's a former uh, United States representative. Um, he was a member of the U.S. House of Reps from Massachusetts from 1981 to 2013. Uh, there was different things in his life. So, a little bit of controversy there at one point. Um, he's openly gay. Um, uh, there's a pretty good documentary Michael Chandler and Sheila Canavan made about him. And I know that some, uh, I, I do think that, that, uh, I liked some of their stuff was handheld in that documentary. Um, but I, I, kn I do know with some of the stuff I've shot that some of it looks very low budget and it's doesn't look as good cause it's not professional set with the lights and all that. Yeah. That la the last movie documentary that I was watching today there's shots with like, say the sound mixer guy who was on the set of the last movie and he's sitting in a room and it's completely dark and you see it's kind of red looking. So it's, 
They didn't use any lighting. They didn't use set up any stuff for some of those shots. And some people would say, oh, this is terrible. You know, this will hurt your chances getting into more film festivals. And maybe that's true. But I was thinking, and this is different because it's a doc, this is not a documentary, but I bet the interview. This is not a documentary. <laughs> I bet the interview that they got with the person, perhaps they opened up a little more because they spent less time getting the shot ready. Mm -hmm. um and less formal right mm -hmm. so it's sort of like don't worry about the camera you don't worry about lights mm -hmm. let's just talk you know but yeah you know i guess it's in some ways that there's a, a sort of similar similar parallel in terms of effect you know for the viewer what they're watching you know for this yeah. it looks it looks more realistic to me in a documentary you're just kind of like oh man it this person, because I've shot stuff that looks pretty bad <laughs> and I wish I could have framed that better or put more lights and stuff, but, um, sorry, I just kind of like going in circles there, but yeah, no, he goes back and the guy checks, uh, Dr. Frank Pierce played by Robert Douglas mm -hmm. checks his. Yeah. I'm going to have to, so Paul, maybe you can grab a screenshot from that, from this moment and, and let everyone, all the listeners see what you see. I think oh, that's yeah, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't even notice, you know, um, the lighting, but I think, yeah, it's, it, it really, the lighting really shapes the experience for the viewer. It shapes your mood. It shapes, you know, what you're, I don't know. I don't want to go into a rabbit hole, but I yeah, think yeah. that's cool. <laughs> okay. So Columbo is in the hospital, gets his pulse taken. Okay. I said all that. And now we're going to go back to Lloyd, who's been on, basically been on lockdown in, on the cruise ship because he's a suspect. So he's been in his cabin and Columbo's in Lloyd's cabin with him, chatting with him about this case. And Lloyd says, he, they're talking about the receipt for the gum, the gum, not the gum, the gun. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd says, yeah, I was in Vegas during the time that that's during the date that's on the receipt, but I did not buy a gun. And, and Lloyd also shares that. Yeah. I, I had a feeling, you know, that Rosanna might have, there might've been another man involved when Rosanna and I broke up and Columbo shows Lloyd a picture of the other man, you know, mm -hmm. Hayden mm -hmm. Danzinger, but Lloyd does not recognize him. Mm hmm. And Lloyd says that Rosanna actually spent a lot of time on that first cruise, the one that Danzinger was on, in her cabin. I love his in pants, Columbus. by the way. What's just, that? I love, uh, sorry, to change. I love no, um, yeah. Lloyd Harrington's pants. The design, it's like these like wavy little zigzaggy kind of thing going across. I but didn't it's even notice. Very Grady Hunt, the colors, it's sort of brown. Yeah. But it looks good. It's really cool. Oh, that's awesome. I, yeah, I didn't even notice the pants. How did I not notice the pants? They're kind of hidden. He's his knee is up in the chair. You can sort of just you have to look at it closely. Yeah. Well, in this moment, the, the Columbo and Harrington kind of have a a brief bonding moment because Columbo says he shows the picture of Danziger, and then Lloyd asks, "Is this the person who?" murdered Rosanna and Columbo says I think so but don't tell anyone because I, I can't prove it yet and then Columbo says keep your spirits up so it's kind of a sweet moment you know Columbo's trying to help this guy out who is basically in lockdown for a crime he did not commit so Columbo's got his man he's got his eyes set on Danziger and in the next scene he actually goes and talks to Danziger's wife but yeah, it, it was cool to see them act together because I don't think they acted in the other one together. No, they didn't. Yeah, yeah. they had no scenes together in. Um, it. Oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the episode. It's, it's great to see them act together. I love it. Yeah, they were so good together. Dean Stockwell was so good. I, I'm so sad that he's passed. He he passed away right in like that, like mm -hmm. in the last year. Very or recently, yeah. Yeah, that's such a bummer. He was so talented um yeah laris hasn't seen blue velvet yet have you seen that one i think we might have mentioned that before 
It's been a while though. But he sings that that Roy Orbison song that Dennis Hopper goes crazy for, or Frank Booth goes crazy for. He he like it's a. Um, I close my eyes and I drift away. I forget what he's what the lyrics are, but it's a really weird, strange uh, scene that Dean Stockwell just sort of um, runs with, you know, just like makes it a such a memorable part in that movie. I'm going to have to rewatch that movie. It's been a while. Yeah, I'm afraid to rewatch. Re- I rewatched <laughs> Mulholland Drive with Laris. He loved Uh-oh. it. Oh, Have he loved it. One? Okay, good. Have you seen that one? Yeah, yeah I think so. What would you think of that one? Oh, gosh, I don't remember. I think I've seen it. Maybe I haven't seen it. Yeah, that one's pretty... Uh, Is it pretty intense? It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty... Yeah, it's, it's all over the place in a lot of ways, but it, it, it's such a... Lee Grant's in that one. Oh, right. And she's got this one scene in it. Yeah, no, it, that that one is is really remarkable to me in a lot of ways. The story, like the way it unfolds and refolds, and what he shows you, like watching it with Laris, and just I sort of rethought a lot of things about it. Um, you were like, "Wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't watch this." <laughs> no, no, <laughs> we're past that. <laughs> Laris is uh, uh, loves uh, David Lynch. He's watched all of Twin Peaks. He's he's keeps trying to get me to. Jane Greer is in Twin Peaks. Did you know that? Oh, no, I did not know that. She's in season two. Yeah, I was trying to get up to her episodes, but I just, you know. Yeah, she's in three or so, the episodes, something like that. Um, In season two, Laris has uh, watched all three seasons. Um, And and I've been wanting to watch the new season that he created for Showtime. Um, But but I started watching more. And yeah, really, because I remember you watched season one and season two with dad, right? Twin Peaks. Yeah. I watched yeah. it when it was live. It was yeah. my favorite thing. I got I got the books. There were like uh, Laura. You could buy Laura Palmer's diary. I bought the mm. Laura Palmer diary. I read that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't know if Dad watched it with me as much as like tolerated me watching it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, probably more like it, huh? Yeah, he was very understanding. I think it was probably like on a school night in he was like, did you do your homework? And, and I would be like, yes. Or like, I, I will. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I need to watch this please. And he would let me watch it. Um, well, I remember you and I watching um, sex lies and videotape in El Paso at home in the day. And I would think I was in college. I think and um, in the dad walked in, I think he was flossing his teeth and then he walked right out, you know, like, <laughs> He was like, like what is like, happening? Well, he, it was his movie. Like, I think, I think he was on his. Oh wow! Okay, one of his VHS, you know, three movies on a tape, <laughs> and us done on EP, you know, like <laughs> six hours of footage. And, and I, yeah, I was like, it's, who knows what their the scene was? You know, there, there's so much knows. sort of grown up, you know, talk about sexual dysfunction and cheating and all that stuff, and um. But it was great. <laughs> just Poor walked dad. out, Lost walked in right teeth. back out. Yeah, <laughs> like I need a sink. I gotta go. I'm sorry. I need a sink. Oh, the, yeah. there was one uh, Willie Varela, the uh, experimental filmmaker. Oh yeah, a mm-hmm. Chicano filmmaker from El Paso. He um, he put together a series for the local El Paso PBS station of other filmmakers who were independent that were like on Canyon cinema and other stuff. And um, I was watching, uh, I think it was Michael Walling's decodings, which is like a found, not a found footage, but like he utilizes other footage. And there was some like sort of sexual uh, symbolic footage being shown while, while the guy was talking about, I think he was talking about being with other men or something. It's very, really cool film. But Grandpa came out, <laughs> Dad's dad, Mom, and he sat down and he watched that with me. Yeah, and he oh, was like, wow. and it was like, you know, he was just like, okay, what are we watching? You know, like, <laughs> like I, <laughs> he just went along with it. You know, like he didn't, you know, I think I think he thought it was interesting. You know, like like oh, this is artistic. For uh, the listener, our grandpa was born in Scotland in like 
or one of our we have two grandpas obviously one of them was born in scotland in like 1912 or something right in lanarkshire a, oh, i don't even yeah. know he had a, but he had a very different you know very different upbringing mm-hmm. than what, what our kids are having today so that's cool wow i'm very impressed with grandpa yeah yeah he liked the beatles i remember that yeah he was a cool guy he liked to have a little um little nightcap a little bit of whiskey right before bed not every night probably but you know yeah, dad said dad said that he that he would just keep it in there or something like he wouldn't drink it much or something like that yeah just like a tiny sip on it or something yeah something like that Okay, back to the cruise ship, back to the Sun Princess. Um, so Columbo goes. So so Columbo just finished up his chat with Lloyd Harrington, and now he's going to go chat with Mrs. Danzinger. Yay, Jane Greer! Yay! <laughs> yeah. So they're outside on the deck. She has a really cool blouse on that has a ton of horses on it. I I oh, spent yeah. about. Two minutes trying to figure out, could I easily identify this blouse? But no. Blouses with horses are like a dime a dozen, Paul. If you want a blouse with a horse, yeah, it's out there. Nowadays still? Yeah, then and now. It's not hard to find. Oh, but yeah, if somebody loves horses, they are going to put that. They're going to, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you would guess that's why they would like it, but. But the, so Columbo and Mrs. Danzinger have a pretty frank chat about Hayden. And we learn that Mrs. Danzinger did not go with Hayden to Vegas on the last trip. We also learn that Mrs. Danzinger does not trust Hayden. What's the word? Like, she's not an idiot. <laughs> like, she's not going to just blindly let him do what he does so she has some expectations or standards Mm -hmm. or i don't know what the word is but but she shares with columbo that she's i I can't remember the word she uses but that she will not let him you know take advantage of her basically yeah most of my friends think that hayden married me for my money and she's like, I'm on to you. Yeah, this her character is um is so not unlike a character she played in Against All Odds, which was a remake of another movie where she played the younger lead character. Against All Odds was James Woods, Jeff Bridges. Did you ever see that? I don't think so. And they had that Phil Collins song. What song? How could you just turn and walk away when all I can do is see you? cry or something it's a very beautiful song i can't okay. sing it <laughs> but i always okay, remember Paul. the music video from the movie i never watched the movie until recently but it um uh, it was a remake of a movie called out of the past where jane greer was the lead um and robert mitchum was the but she was sort of like um uh she she's considered a film noir sort of performer in her early movies so there's this book called um dark city dames mm. and it covers all the noir films that jane greer did and it also has a later chapter about what she's been up to in an interview with her um but in the remake of out of the past by uh taylor hackford i don't know how it did i think people were jane wasn't very happy about the the main character that rachel ward played that was but in that movie, she, the new one, she plays this very rich woman who's very, it's kind of a, she's a little dark character. She's darker than this one in the Columbo, but it's similar. You know, a woman who has all this power and money and, and knows how to, she knows when people are, she knows she has to be very careful with even the, her husband, you know. Uh, Richard Widmark plays her husband in that one, I think, in the new one. But um, and here it's a great scene with her and Peter Falk with the wind blowing their hair all over the place. Yeah, yeah I like I her dialogue part. and her performance here. Yeah, I feel like I wish they could have made this episode longer and had mm-hmm. a bit more with her. Yeah, she yeah she really doesn't get enough time. 
And it's not odd. I mean, it just kind of flows. But if someone were a total outsider to Columbo, they might be like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like, why is he talking to her about her husband? What's, you know, like, what's this all about? Um, but if they had more time to develop this back and forth between Columbo and Mrs. Danzinger. So you feel like the scene, cool you feel like this scene is a little out of left field because we don't see much of her in general. I mean, it's not because Columbo is suspecting an, an affair, right? Mm-hmm. So um, he's trying to figure that out. Yeah. But it's just, it's just, it's a little bit abrupt, you know, it's a little bit, um, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a detective. Like, I don't know how else he would have <laughs> <laughs> approached this scenario. And he had such limited time and it's not even his case really, but it is a little bit like, um, it's a little bit out of left field for him to just go up to her and start talking. I'm glad he did though. I mean, mm-hmm. she's amazing. I, I, I really liked watching her in all of her scenes. Yeah. Well, he's trying to figure out how, how he could get, how is Lloyd Harrington getting stuck in this as being, you know, how would Robert, how would Hayden Danziger know to do that, you know, or, or have that, you know, set him up. Right. So how do you figure that out? If Danziger's never even seen him before, if, or, um, uh, Lord Harrington, Lloyd Harrington has never seen him before, you know? So did you know your husband was having an affair or, you know, why did, you know, why did he shoot her? You know? No, I mean, yeah, he's got a, grasp at thing grasp at whatever he can to make sense of this it's um it makes sense it's just a little bit you know he's in a rush scenario here and Mm -hmm. he does he just has like nothing to chat with her about he has like no um you know no cover for this conversation it's just out of left field for her Mm -hmm. basically well, she knows he's um, fishing, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. She does great. She she tolerates it. It's it totally flows. It's just when I've seen this like five or six times or maybe even seven where I'm like, it's kind of I don't know, it just feels a little bit uh, of a stretch, I guess. But I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um All right, so now we're going to go talk with the doctor. And the doctor, I love this scene. I love the the visual of this Mm -hmm. scene. Yeah. The doctor is in an empty dining room that has this beautiful 70s green plaid carpet with matching green plaid dining chairs. And Columbo says, quote, I'd like to ask you a sticky question. And he talks to the doctor about this idea of could Danzinger have faked his heart attack? And the doctor is great. The doctor is very open and says yes. And says these, these are the medications that could have caused that to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm just looking at the scene now again. It's yeah. I love it because it's yeah. Douglas is great. He's very calm. He's like, yeah, I think you could do that. It's very real. But it's like, he's, this guy was in so many, he was in a movie with Errol Flynn, you know? Wow. Um, you know, it's just so like, cool. yeah, it's the, the fact that they cast him in there in this, in this sort of. And that he movie. said yes to mm-hmm. this as well. Right. Like, mm-hmm. that's really cool. He's I don't like, think yeah, he turned do down. Yeah. I don't think Douglas turned down much stuff. He was in like, you remember that, one step beyond series. It was like a supposedly real stories, but there was sort of twilight zone ish. He's in like three of these. Oh, I don't know those I don't, at I, all. And I watched all three. I, I, I've mentioned them once in another episode. The, when we did the, uh, Herkos, the actor who played Peter Herkos, who was like a psychic kind of guy. Anyway, Douglas was in three of those as the lead in each one. <laughs> like, um, it's, it's yeah it's like he he just he's like oh, i got a gig i'm gonna go you know just just keep working you know yeah yeah i get it i get it well yeah in this scene he he talks to columbo and he he says you know this is how he could have faked it 
And he gives Columbo a very specific idea about one specific drug. And I can't remember the name now. Is it amid? It's not amitriptyline. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't matter. There's some specific drug that could mm-hmm. have mimicked the symptoms of a heart attack. And it comes in a capsule, like a little plastic capsule that you break open. And so, and, and, and it kicks in immediately, like within a minute or so. So you're, if you're going to use it to fake a heart attack, you have to ingest it right immediately, like right by wherever you're going to have your fake heart attack or whatever. So Columbo knows to go to the pool because this is where Danziger fell and had his fake heart attack. And this is another one of those moments where another, another scene where I love all the costumes, all the colors, all the different people who were there, like different shapes and sizes. And it feels very real, which it probably was. Columbo's there. He finds, he pulls out the filter from the pool and he finds this capsule that the doctor mentioned that Danzinger may have used to ingest this medication. And Columbo gets a little bit wet in this scene. And um, it's always fun, you know, to see him get just a little bit. <laughs> and here you can kind of see some of the, on. some of the background people. Mm-hmm. They're not, they're not actors. They're just staring at the star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some of it's brief though. It's it, yeah. it, for the most part, it's brief. Most of the actors sort of look away. Yeah, it's so fun. So while Columbo is there getting the capsule out, Danzinger is up like not far away on a nearby deck and he sees this happening. So he sees Columbo Mm -hmm. pulling the filter out of the pool and digging around in it and pulling the capsule out. So Danzinger is, you know, hopefully he's on high alert now. Oh, yeah. He stops when he sees him. (laughs) Yeah. He's kind of moving around. Danziger's moving around a little bit. And then he stops when he sees Columbo, like pulling the bag out of the water. As he should. Columbo <laughs> is on to him. He's going down. <laughs> so in the next scene, Columbo has headed back towards the hospital and he's talking with the doctor and the nurse about, you know, all of his thoughts and questions and findings. The captain of the ship walks in and asks Columbo, like, please drop this investigation. We're mm-hmm. almost to our, our dock. Like, what are you doing? It's clearly Lloyd Harrington. So Columbo has to bring everyone up to speed in this scene and share all of the evidence that he's found to try to get the captain on board. He points out that Danzinger had this increased heart rate unexpectedly at around the same time of the murder. He points out that Danzinger could easily make a fake ID to purchase a gun in Lloyd Harrington's name in Vegas. And he shares that he found a capsule that is for the medication, amitriptyline or whatever the name is. Um, He found the capsule in the filter by the pool. And it's funny that if you notice the doctor and uh, Melissa, the nurse, they stick their heads out. And they're like staring, kind of peeking around. And then as soon as the captain walks back, they tur- they turn, they're turned around immediately. So they obviously <laughs> didn't want to be seen as, it's very quick. It's the editing. Oh, but... that's cool. I didn't see that. Yeah. Um. All right, Paul, we're going to dance now. All right. Are you we're... ready to dance? Yeah. Are you ready for a conga line? <laughs> dead end, dead end, dead end. Wasn't dad and mom in this scene? Weren't they in the... Yeah, her parents are in this scene. Yep, they were on this... And mom has Sean in her belly. (laughs) Oh, yeah, this is a fun moment. That would be be Liz. That would be you. You were in this? Isn't this your own... I am in this scene. Yeah, I was in in mom's belly for two years, so... (laughs) I was here. It's amazing. (laughs) It was amazing. It was amazing. Do you remember that when you were in the womb? I totally remember all of this. <laughs> you could be yeah, regressed I'm... to find that out, though. You know that, right? <laughs> Come down to Los Angeles, Liz. We'll teach you all about that. I'm going to go to your favorite psychic. 
<laughs> yeah, my memory regressed to when I was in utero. In utero. And you can get regressed to before that, your previous life. Oh, that'd be good. And here comes. Yeah. Who's coming up in the scene? <laughs> who's in the um, scene, Liz? Columbo. Before they sit down. Oh, Lolly. Mike Lolly. Mike Lolly, yeah. Mike Lolly. All right. So next scene, it's a dance party. Columbo is in his party togs. And I was curious, how many times is Columbo not wearing his traditional outfit? And I looked at Columbo Files blog. It's 13 times. 13, 13 times. times. Mm -hmm. So he's not in his traditional togs. He's in another lounge. There's a huge conga line. Actually, I don't know if Columbus in the lounge or just nearby the lounge, but there's a huge conga line. A lot of fun happening here. And Columbo finds Danzinger out on a very nearby deck at another party. It's like parties everywhere. There's like inside parties, outside parties. Danzinger's at an outside party. Finds Columbo finds him and they go inside to have a drink together in a quieter lounge. And this is where they have scotch and water, which is not our drink because I do not like scotch. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm okay with margaritas. And, Paul, this is where we see one of our old-time buddies. Mike Lally. Do you... Mike Lally. Yeah. Mike Lally is the bartender here when they order their scotch and water. And this is where Columbo plants the seeds to Danzinger that he needs to find the gloves that clearly the murderer Lloyd Harrington used gloves for this murder. And until he finds the gloves, they can't close the books on this case. And, um, I, I, I made a little note here that the two of them are sitting side by side. And there's a moment where Columbo pauses to take a drink and Danzinger just kind of like looks over at Columbo and just very subtly like takes him in from like from head to toe, just sort mm -hmm. of absorbs who is this person next to me who mm -hmm. is like, ah, he's so good. Robert Vaughn is so good. Yeah, this, this scene. Episode. Yeah, this this might have been my favorite scene with the two of them. Yeah, just his his reactions while he's drinking, and like you know, like his responses to to, to Peter Falk. And I I wonder like how much of that was scripted, or how mm -hmm. much of that was him as an actor. You know that moment where he ch like kind of very subtly like turns and looks and just absorbs Columbo you know like it was that scripted it, I mean it must have been but it was it was so good him looking at him so scripted good. you're saying yeah just Columbo's like Columbo just lays all this out to Robert Vaughn mm -hmm. and then he Columbo stops and he pauses and he takes a sip and while he's doing that the camera turn you know focuses on Robert Vaughn a little bit and he just he just like sort of absorbs Columbo. He just sort of like mm -hmm. takes him in from yeah. top to bottom. Like mm -hmm. what, who is he, this? He kind of does it slightly. And then there's a third time where he does it much. He does it a little more than the other mm -hmm. two times. But yeah, it, it, even when it's, so that, that one is like uh, more to Fox left. And the other one is more to his, to Vaughn's right. The first shots. And, the, but they're both just as compelling. But yeah, he does the old, we just need this. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah, only, the only thing is, though, is like, he would, it would need to be, he would still need to have the fingerprints of um, Lloyd Harrington on there. Yeah, but Columbo, but um, Danzinger doesn't really get it. Like, he's not, Danzinger is not catching all the important tidbits, right? Like, you and I know that those fingerprints would be important, but Columbo's just saying, like, all I need is the gloves, and that's going to, like, wrap this up. Mm -hmm. And Danzinger isn't even thinking about fingerprints. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. I yeah. But he, still, like, like, you'd think, like, well, but you still need the fingerprints. How could you say it was this, you know? But I guess if the if the gun 
But why would he put his fingerprints on that? Why would he leave them on, on the, there? Well, he doesn't under. I don't think he understands. I mean, he definitely doesn't understand so that. that he, he would have his... to do the same thing again, like no fingerprints. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Why would you? Yeah, why would exactly. you not not have gloves on again? <laughs> yeah, I mean, poor Danzinger. Like he doesn't quite get what columbus doing which you know thankfully because that's how columbus gonna get him in the end right mm -hmm. but he the dancinger thinks that it's just he about just finding gloves, gloves yeah with powder marks dancinger doesn't even think about like oh there could be fingerprints on it i mean he's just not i don't know i don't know if it's like his immaturity which he Mm -hmm. showed earlier with his wife like he's just not a super mature thinker i don't know or maybe he's really egotistical and thinks that his plan is brilliant and he's just you know could never be caught i don't know i don't know what his weakness is but he clearly has a weakness because he's going down he's going down okay so so things are wrapping up here Columbo plants the seed about the gloves and then Danzinger steals some latex gloves from the hospital. He goes out of his way. He steals the magician's gun or borrows it. Maybe. I don't know. Cause he returns it, borrows the gun, fires the gun, gets the, the um, powder burns or powder marks or whatever on the gloves. And then he hides the gloves inside a fire hose um like little wall you know cabinet where you wrap up the the uh fire hose and mm -hmm. you know i don't know what the name is for that but he hides the gloves in there and and then we're almost at the end here so so he's finished all of that it's the next morning and he is in the they're in the Union Jack bar having their breakfast. It looks like it's croissants and coffee. Mm -hmm. And he keeps checking his watch. And his wife is confused. She says, why do you keep checking your watch? What's going on? He's waiting for the alarm test to go off for the ship. Mm -hmm. And when it goes, because he knows when it goes off that someone's going to pull out a fire hose and find the gloves that he planted. And of course that's what happens. Columbo. So the fire, uh, some alarm goes off. All of the crew goes out and one of the crew members spots latex gloves, calls the purser over. They take it to the captain Columbo shows up to the flight deck and Columbo is ready to just wrap this up. And Columbo asks someone to get Danzinger and Columbo turns the latex gloves wrong side out and he uses his pencil lead test again and searches for fingerprints in the latex gloves. And he says, he finds some, he says, big as life, sir, big as life. And he asks Danzinger to give his fingerprints. He says, these are not, he says, these are not Harrington's fingerprints. I've already taken his fingerprints, but I want to see yours and I want to compare them. And, and, and then Danzinger's caught. He says, what if I tell you they're mine? And then everyone calls him on it and says, um, why would you do this? And Danziger does not have a good answer. He says, how did you figure it out? Columbo says, I figured it out from this feather that I found in the hospital. And he still has the feather with him in his mm -hmm. pocket. But this is not the end, Paul. This is mm -hmm. not the end of the episode. <laughs> the end of the episode is Columbo trying to find his wife again. Mm -hmm. And the either I can't remember if it's the purser or the captain Columbus says, have you seen my wife? And one of them says she just left on that boat to the, to the land, to the mainland. And Columbo says, Oh, the, the boat that that's a boat. And this is a, a ship. And he finally, <laughs> it finally clicks for him. And he says to hell with it. And he, and that's the end. So it ends on like a funny button. Mm 
-hmm. You know, it doesn't end. Normally these end on a little bit of a heavy note where Mm -hmm. the bad guy has been caught for their awfulness. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And not this time it ends after the bad guy has been caught. And now it's just Columbo and his wife trying to have a fun time. And I, in Koenig's book, he mentions that the writers toyed with the idea of showing Mrs. Columbo in this episode. Yeah. But they ultimately decided not to do that. And also, the, the, I like the end before that where he says, how do you know was this feather was, wasn't from one of you know, the hospital oh, yes. pillows? And he's yes. like, Is it, they're just foam. I, I love that. Yeah, I, I liked his reaction too. I thought he did an excellent reaction for Robert Vaughn. You know, like he's not, I mean, I haven't, I don't know his filmography too well, but he, 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 I'm not quite sure if he tears up at all. I don't think he does, but it looks, no, there's he some kind tear of, up here. yeah, there's a sort of a sentiment kind of like a, he kind of, there's some nice shading in there. Uh, I was really pleased with this ending. Um, with this gotcha or whatever. I I thought it was really good from everybody there. The three of them, you know, the captain Columbo and Hayden Danziger. Yeah. I thought it was excellent. That this to me was a good gotcha, like a good, like a gotcha, man. I loved it. I love the moment where he says, Columbo says, sir, whatever, like something like, will you now, you know, place your finger whatever he says i can't remember the exact wording yeah yeah right then (laughs) that's so good (laughs) Columbo is so calm and he's like smiling and he's like will you now please show us your fingerprints right there and he's doing that this old man that's when he's like you know you gotta watch out man Columbo's like he's like oh yeah baby (laughs) (laughs) i'm getting this down i got you so good (laughs) <laughs> all right well paul let's wrap this up with our ratings we try to rate all the episodes on a scale of one to ten where does this land for you this one's good i, I might give it a 10 you know i, I think it's oh a 10 yeah or maybe 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 uh if i had i mean there i could i felt like there could have been a little more you know, the old cat and Matt, like him and jabbing, you know, sort of jousting, I should say. Um, there wasn't a lot of that, even though there was, there was a little bit, you know, um, maybe not that, maybe like 9.5. How about that? I want to <laughs> see this one again, though. This was great. It was just so good. The cast was so good. It was like so well mm-hmm. cast. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, you know, Dean Hargrove, Ronald Kibbe, Everett Chambers, Edward K. Dobbs, Falk, and everybody just coming together. It was really what this is one of the one of the strongest casts, I think. Everybody got enough screen time, and, and probably because they're on the ship, so you know you would have to see a little more of them. Yeah. Um, except for I feel like the Greer one, there could have been there could have been more with her. I think. Yeah, somehow. for sure. And Beach Bum. I mean, whatever his <laughs> name is, like there was not enough of him and his navy blue speedo. Yeah. So, what would you give it? What's your rating? I mean, I I, I gotta go high. Also, Paul, I, I maybe like nine, nine and a half. Nine. All right. Have you given Between it a high? nine and nine and a half? Have you given I a, mean, a ten? A ten yet? I feel like I I was just wondering. Did I give a ten to my two favorites? I sure hope so. Um. Candidate for Crime. No, Candidate for Crime. crime. That's right. And Friend and D. Those are my two all time favorites. And this is not better than those and not as good as those for different reasons, but still amazing. So maybe like, let's say (laughs) 9.3. This is like the shadow to a friend indeed, you know, Ben Gazzara, they probably said, that's too dark. You can't, you're so dark. So now he did like the opposite. <laughs> Ends it on a light note. It begins in a light note. Yeah. So. Yeah. This one has way more lightness to it. And I like, you know, the other two, my favorites have a little bit more darkness and the music like brings you emotionally up and down. And this one 
you don't have the same emotional up and down, but there, there's so much greatness going on just visually. The ship on the ocean is awesome to watch and all of the extras are beautiful with their clothes and the interior of the cruise ship is so fun to see. And then Columbo's hilarious at the beginning and the end and in the middle. So yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's way up there. And then the music, this song Volare is a total earworm. I mean, Mm -hmm. me and the girls will sing this (laughs) in the house. Like, you know, you get us going and then we're all singing. It's like, (laughs) it just, and and like I said, I'm going to spare our dear listeners, but we will get going. The three of us with this (laughs) song. It's just so fun. Yeah, and they thank the the uh, princess cruises at the end. Yeah, I mean, it is a nice thing to do to let a uh, film crew come on and film a murder mm-hmm. <laughs> on your vacation. You know, it's your vacation cruise. It's not exactly what people want to connect yeah. with your... But if you picked one, Columbo's a good one. <laughs> oh, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'd rather be on the Colombo cruise than the Hawaii Five-O cruise, personally. Okay, Paul, so we often end our shows with trivia where you try to stump me. Yeah. Okay, you ready to be stumped? I can do it. I'm ready for you to try to stump me. All right. Let's put it that way. So the band, you know that band Danzig? Yes, I know the band Danzig. Mm Mm-hmm. So they they that name is taken from Hayden Danziger, this character. No. You sure? What? Are you serious? No. It's true. False. false. Yeah, you're right. It's false. I'm gonna say false. It's from Glenn Danzig, <laughs> the guy who's <laughs> the singer of the who's band. Glenn? Oh, okay. Much better. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um. Oh, here I'm gonna give you a different one. So this will be like a A B C. You pick A B C D or E or F. So uh, I, I, me, worked on a film with A, Dean Stockwell, B, uh, Poupe, what's her name, Bacar? (laughs) Yeah, that sounds right. (laughs) Bacar. C, Jane Greer. Whoa. D, Curtis Creedle, the magician guy. E, none of the above. (laughs) F. All of the above. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Come on, Paul. Liz. You got this. One, one, one film. Or you're saying you've worked on one film with this person or persons? Or, or F is all of the above, which means I would have worked with, you know, each one on one film. No, I'm going to say false. <laughs> <laughs> No, Dean Stockwell. What? Which yeah. one? Which it, film? It, it was a documentary. He was the narrator. It was, uh, um, uh, it was a series. Nancy Redstar, she's a writer. Um, she knew Dean Stockwell. And uh, it's called um, uh, Ancestors. Uh, Star, An- Star Ancestors. So, yeah, I just sort of helped out with... Um, so I got editing credit and like a sort of a sort of associate producer. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah. That was, we got to uh, include that one in the show notes too, Paul. What's the name again? Uh, it's called, um, it's called star ancestors. Yeah. It's sort of, uh, she based it on her, one of her books. She has a couple books. Well, she has s- several books out. Uh, she's really a great thinker, writer, sort of, capturing stuff from uh elders tribal elders and their there are each person that she interviewed some of them had their own history of what their ancestors taught them about uh the other people you know like people some people would call them aliens or something but each person that she interviews um had their own story and their own uh take on what their grandmother taught them or what they actually experienced, you know? So yeah, I helped her out 
on one of her, one of the uh, projects, one of the episodes. I think it was the first one. I kind of, she was just sort of trying to get it back on the ground, but um, she, she put, put out a couple of them and he narrated uh, the first one. He might've worked on, he might've narrated the second one too. I can't remember. Very cool, Paul. Yeah. So, okay. So you've got one right and you've got one wrong. <laughs> I'm going to crush this. Let's go. <laughs> so all of them, the, the, not Peter Falk, but the other main characters, Jane Greer, Robert Vaughn, Dean Stockwell, they all had something to do with uh, Howard Hughes, the, you know, the billionaire Oh yeah, guy. Paul, I know Howard Hughes. RKO. Come on. <laughs> tool. Sure. Yeah, er, er, I'll say yes. Not a, oh, the not not a, They all did. I'm gonna say true? yeah. Sure. I don't know, Liz. I just kind of. Get <laughs> that. Okay, so Dean Stockwell, he was in a movie called The Boy with Green Hair. And he was the boy with green hair, and it was sort of a sympathy towards people who are different, you know, whether it's ethnicity or, and Howard Hughes took over RKO, fired a bunch of people, creative people. And it was a hard time for all the studios, but uh, they definitely didn't make much money and probably the other ones didn't make as much either. But so anyway, this movie, he hated it and he thought they should put some anti-communist dialogue for Dean Stockwell to say, uh <laughs> well because he he okay. i mean he, he he was uh you know you read about him there's a lot of not not great things hughes uh, but dean, stockwell dean stockwell also played him played howard hughes in the francis ford coppola film tucker the man in his dream which is an interesting film i enjoyed that film um but jane greer was brought to hollywood because of howard hughes howard hughes saw her what? picture in an, in an ad yeah Ew. in an ad and he, <laughs> Ew. Brought, he brought him and his <laughs> daughter out here. Yeah, no, he was in. Yeah, anyway, that's as far as we need for that one. Okay, <laughs> we'll stop that there. You will stop there, <laughs> Paul. Um, and then so, so Patrick McNee, who plays our Captain Gibbon, mm-hmm. uh, his his grandmother had a premonition about the Titanic before it happened. No, what? Okay. Yeah. Sh- sure. You sure about yes. that? Yes. What? <laughs> I don't know anything about Patrick. Mc- false. McNee. False. Okay, it's false. <laughs> yeah, that I just completely made up. However, wow. however, Paul, you are so good at making up fake information. <laughs> I got. However, say. in the episode that Patrick McNee was in, in One Step Behind, uh-huh. he plays the fiance. Of a woman who keeps having these bad dreams, and supposedly this was true by their screenwriters, Collier Young. She kept having these nightmares, and she would tell her fiance, played by Patrick McNee, "No, I can't. I don't want to go on this Titanic. I think there's something's got bad's going to happen." Oh wow! Yeah. So, so what's interesting is that in the episode they talked about the host of the show said there was a book, there's a book called Futility, a book called Futility by Morgan Robertson that came out in 1898. Now, if you look up the book Futility. <laughs> oh, Paul, you're taking me down a deep dive. Here. I know, I know, but it's interesting. Okay, so when I'm fu- here, I'm, fu- I'm, I'm with out, you. Right, it came out, the book came out in um, 1898. Uh, in in the book. An old book. In the book, the 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 first half of Futility introduces the 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 ship called the Titan. It's described as the longest and fastest ship in the world. It's also considered unsinkable. However, what happens is that it hits an iceberg, and all the people die. Whoa. So this came out 14 years before the Titanic. Whoa! But there's a lot of similarities within the book. Do 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 do. <laughs> yeah, and there's another book called um uh what was the name of it? Oh, did I write it down? Lucifer's Hammer. And Lucifer's Hammer is about this comet that two different people see at the same time and they give it a name. So it uses the names of each of the person's last name, and the name of that comet is Hamner Brown. And then you know, there was 
there was the uh hail bop oh yeah seen I know by Hale two Bop. different astronomers so it's they're mm-hmm. both of those astronomers who f- saw hail bop you know they're both from two different backgrounds one was like a I think one was it was an astronomer and the other one was like just loved looking at for comments but that's similar in the hb you know a comet being called something before it ever was discovered so in that book anyway both of those guys the hellbop guys they knew about <laughs> that book lucifer's hammer and they thought it was really cool of such a coincidence anyway so what's the next one uh uh-huh. I don't know. Is there a question there, Paul? No, I just thought it was kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the futility book was really weird, right? Yes. Um, they, that's oh, crazy. Well, you know, what's his name was in the Titanic? Leonardo uh, DiCaprio? <laughs> uh, the uh, the purser. No way. Yes, he's what? in the Titanic. He, he is the uh, Colonel Archibald Gracie. Wow. I know that is a coincidence right there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> How is he cast in another show with a ship? That's bananas. <laughs> That's all I got, Liz. That's you, it. You did all right. Yeah, you did okay. So wait, did I I got one out of two? You got one out of five. <laughs> <laughs> no, you put, I think you got a couple in there. You got a couple in there. So. Okay. Excellent. We can't keep track. How yeah. can we be expected to keep track? Mm-hmm. We need an assistant to, to help us. <laughs> All right, Paul. Well, that was fun talking with that. We get, talking about that episode. Wow, this tequila got no my more tongue all. Tequila, all. Liz. Stop. I Let just had the it. one margarita in my. I can't. <laughs> I know speak. how you feel. <laughs> yeah. But we want to wrap it up. We want to say thank you to Maxime Gervais for our theme song, Columbo. Thank you. Thank you. And this podcast is edited by John Warenas. Thank you very much, John. And if you want to add to our conversation, share your thoughts on Columbo, please email us at trenchcoatcigar at gmail.com or message us on Instagram at trenchcoat cigar or add a comment to our posts. And we have exclusive content on Patreon. If you would like to watch us have these wonderful conversations, you can watch us on there. We also have a YouTube channel. If you want to listen on YouTube, you can find us on there as well. And Paul, one other thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Yay.